Good afternoon. Today is March 3rd, 2022. Welcome to the bill hearings of the Ways and Means Committee. First up is House Bill 355, a Prince George's County delegation bill, which the wonderful Delegate Julian Ivey will be presenting. Delegate Ivey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, for the record, Delegate Julian Ivey here to present House Bill 355. Uh, the legislation is the product of several work groups uh, and many years of discussions surrounding the Prince George's County Board of Education uh, and its makeup. Currently, we are in a hybrid format. Uh, we have nine elected members who represent individual districts, four members appointed by the county executive, one student member who does not have the authority to vote on budgetary and various disciplinary actions. Um, this legislation creates a work group uh, which will look into district residency requirements, age restrictions, eligibility criteria, public financing for candidates, impact of term limits, uh, electoral process that achieves a board composition that reflects the gender and racial diversity of Prince George's County, uh, compensation, best practices for mandatory continuing education requirements for board members, uh, clarifying roles of the board and the CEO, establishment and use of advisory committees, appropriate removal authority and mechanisms for members, uh, including visibility of an ethics panel process, uh, guidelines for ethics complaint process, uh, actions that may be taken based on the findings of an ethics complaint, removal of the governor from oversight process, leaving the State Board of Education as the final authority. So we're looking into a lot. Uh, the work group would consist of the following members, the chair, the Prince George's County Senate delegation or its designee, um, also one member of the Senate, Maryland who represents the county, uh, appointed by the chair of the Prince George's County delegation, uh, one member of the House delegation appointed by the chair and also the chair's designee, um, it would also include the chair of the Prince George's County Board of Education or its designee, one representative from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, one representative from the disabled community, uh, and we might be looking to add uh, a member of the ESOL community as well. Um, at the beginning of each term, each board member shall attend an orientation and be provided with training materials. Um, that would actually take effect um, this year. The legislation does change another provision, specifically that the chair and vice chair would be selected by the members of the Board of Education rather than by the county executive. Uh, the legislation maintains uh, that elected members would represent their individual districts and removes whether members should be elected at large or in any other format from the study. Uh, this provision specifically is very significant due to school boundary lines and bus routes uh, being such localized issues, and therefore their representatives should also be uh, very locally focused. Uh, the bill is the product of compromise, which allowed for the legislation to move out of the Prince George's County Education Subcommittee unanimously. I'm truly proud that we were able to form a consensus uh, when dealing with what could have been a very divisive issue. Uh, the legislation is scheduled to be voted on by the larger delegation tomorrow morning. Uh, it is supported by the Prince George's County Executive um, and with our delegation letter, we'll be asking for a favorable report on House Bill 355 and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Ivy? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 355. Thank you. Thank Next, you, how, thank you. House Bill 812, Montgomery County Delegation Bill presented by Delegate Chi. Whenever you're ready, Delegate Chi. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Atterbury and the members of the Ways and Means Committee. I'm Delegate Lily Chi here to present HB 812 on behalf of the Montgomery County Delegation. HB 812 is a simple local bill that requires the Montgomery County Board of Education to adopt a data disaggregation policy that includes a category for each racial and ethnic student group that makes up at least 5% of the enrolled student population in the county school system. This data disaggregation policy must be consistently applied to all the school system's data collection, reporting, and documentation including in its equity accountability framework. 
This bill is needed to make sure that the fastest growing student populations, such as Asian Americans and mixed race students, are also properly tracked and reported in our data analysis and communication, instead of being lumped together with whites and all others at times. This bill got a unanimous support from the Montgomery County delegation and the support of the MCPS Board of Education because it simply codifies and clarifies its current policy with the 5% threshold requirement. As the primary sponsor of this local bill and on behalf of the Montgomery County delegation, I urge the committee a favorable vote on HB 812. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate G? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 812. Next, House Bill 512, Delegate Guyton, and there is one individual after you that will have two minutes, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members and colleagues on the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, Delegate Michelle Guyton from District 42B in Baltimore County. I have the easiest, fastest bill for you today. I'm asking for your favorable report on House Bill 512, which simply transfers one appointed position on the Professional Standards Teaching Education Board, which is also called PISTAB, from the Association of Independent Maryland Schools, called AIMS, there are a lot of acronyms in this one, uh, to the Maryland Association of Non-Public Special Education Foundation, MANSEF. So for many years, AIMS has been informally offering one of its positions to MANSEF for appointment. This statutory change formalizes this process and it's done at the request of both organizations. So you will hear from Dory Flynn from MANSEF and you have in your packet a letter of, um, of request for this change from Peter Bailey of Ames. Thank you so much and thank you for your favorable report on House Bill 512. Thank Good you, Ms. Ms. Flynn for two minutes, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Delegate Guyton for sponsoring this bill. I'm Dory Flynn, I'm the Executive Director of MANSEP, which is the Maryland Association of Non-Public Special Education Facilities. I very happily and proudly represent 70 non-public special education schools all across Maryland, serving approximately 3,800 publicly funded students. I'm here today to, in support of House Bill 512 to alter the composition of the PISTAB board. The MANSEP schools are approved by MSDE under COMAR 13A09.10. Our teachers are certified by MSDE, just like their public school counterparts. The actions taken by PISTAB have a direct bearing on the career development paths of the professionals that we employ. So MANSEF representation in this board will be very beneficial for our teachers and aid in the efforts to ensure that we have properly credentialed and highly qualified individuals educating Maryland special needs students. There are, as Delegate Guyton said, the other non-public schools that are represented on the PISTAB and we've had an informal agreement for the past few years where they've given up one of their slots to us. So I believe that altering this uh, membership may seem like an insignificant thing, but it will have great benefit and value to us and we will make sure to be a really strong contributing member. So I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 512. Next, calling House Bill 793, Delegate Lasanti, and there are four folks after you. So whenever you're ready, Delegate. Absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair and my distinguished colleagues on the House Ways and Means Committee, Delegate Marianne Lasanti for the record. Um, most Marylanders agree that community has an important role to play in our public schools, sadly, the pandemic has injected political theater into educational policy. Wrongfully, but understandably, fear, uncertainty, and conflicting information have made many parents and caregivers feel left out of key decision-making. True or not, perception is reality. I know that this committee is working very hard to find a path forward. House Bill 793 adds an important element to this discussion by requiring each county board of education to designate a community ombudsman. The purpose is to provide a neutral party within the school system for parents, caregivers, and community members to get answers to their questions about policies and procedures. While I know this committee often shies away 
from legislating operating requirements for our school system, this is very different. This creates a direct line of communication for the sharing of information and problem solving. Too often this role is relegated to many to various people, therefore inaccurate and incomplete information is provided, which creates community conflict. This bill is simple to implement. You don't have to hire anybody. You just have to select somebody and, to, and, and give them this role in the community. Passage will enhance public trust. The fiscal note indicates that the bill's requirement can be handled within existing budget resources for those jurisdictions to use existing staff. For those reasons, I request a favorable report on House Bill 793. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. There is a Susan Smith signed up to testify, but she is not in the um, She has a, She's going to send, she's sending it by written. I apologize okay. for that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so then we have two unfavorables. John Willems, please, for two minutes. Madam Chair, I have him down as only written. Oh, you're right. So that's it. So are there any questions? See, Haley keeps me straight. Haley and Sarah. Okay, seeing no questions, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 793. Next, Delegate Boatler for House Bill 825, whenever you're ready. Delegate Boatler? Madam Chair? Yes, there you go. It, are Hello? you ready? Yes, for House Bill 825. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chairman Atterbury, members of the Ways and Means Committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on House Bill 825. <clears throat> this bill aims to establish a task force to evaluate existing school literacy programs and requires the task force to evaluate these programs, determine strategy for an I think Delegate Boatler, you're having some connectivity problems. If you can hear us. Delegate Boatler. Okay, uh, if we could contact Delegate Boatler's office and just ask them to have him hop off and come back on. And I know he has three bills. Will do. Thank you. And then um, Haley, I, I, I will just give you a minute. We're gonna move on to 652 Delegate Guidance Bill but I'll give you a minute to get those people in since it's out of order right now. <laughs> okay, give me one second. Thank you. Okay, we can stop. Okay, hey, so calling House Bill 652, Delegate Guyton. Thank you so much again, Madam Chair, colleagues on Ways and Means. Again, Delegate Michelle Guyton from District 42B in Baltimore County. And I am here to request your consideration as how, of House Bill 652, More Opportunities for Career Focused Student Act. 652 provides more opportunities to students who may be interested in pursuing a career straight out of high school that does not require a college education. The state of Maryland has coined the term career and college readiness to describe the optimal preparedness for all of our graduating students. But we all know that for too long, the emphasis on higher education, the college part, has been much greater than that on the career portion, career readiness. So the blueprint of Maryland's future recognizes the value of career technology education and licensing and apprenticeship programs for many of our students. And this bill strives to support that work in three very simple ways. 
The first involves the use of an online platform for most of our Maryland schools. It is Navion. So if you have a child right now who is in a public school, particularly if they are in middle school or high school, you know Navion. Navion is where high school students can explore their interests, their potential careers. And what it does is it sends you lists of colleges to which you might want to apply. So right now, students only see the colleges on Naviance, but this bill will widen the scope of Naviance to include potential employers and apprenticeship sponsors. If, if, uh, if a child, a student, for instance, says, I'd rather go into a trade rather than to college, they don't get anything. Now they will. So Naviance has already indicated to the sponsors that they possess the ability to do this and they're willing to do so. They just need a request from the school systems to make this happen. So number two is that House Bill 652 requires equal visibility between apprenticeship sponsors and potential employees and college recruitment within the school setting. So if there's a college fair, we would like for them to also have a recruitment fair for apprenticeships and for, uh, for trade associations. Very simply, we all know if you go into high school, there's a big board that has a whole bunch of college pennants on it. We'd ask for equal visibility, which means let's also have a board that has some jobs and some trades and some licensure opportunities on it. So um, this will ensure that students are aware of their opportunities outside of attending college. And then third, some schools, not all, pay for tests such as the PSATs, the SATs, or the AP tests. So our county pays for SATs, for instance. Some districts do not pay for these. This bill says that if a school chooses to pay for those academic tests, they must also pay for licensing credentialing tests and apprenticeship tests where appropriate. So this way a student won't avoid going into those areas, won't avoid an apprenticeship because they don't have the money to pay for the tests. And some, sometimes those can actually be fairly expensive. The bill will provide resources to our career focused students that are not now available to them. It'll help them match job opportunities uh, with their interest, and it will also elevate the choice to go into the workforce rather than to go directly into college. So I urge you to vote favorably on House Bill 652. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Len Lucci for two minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, members of the House Ways and Means Committee. My name is Len Lucci. I'm here today on behalf of the Maryland Workforce Alliance. That's a coalition of trade unions, uh, or rather labor unions, trade organizations, and apprenticeship providers all working together on workforce issues, especially ones that deal with apprenticeships. Um, our coalition is very uh, grateful to Delegate Guyton for sponsoring the More Opportunities for Career Focused Students Act of 2022. We think it'll give students who are looking at starting in a trade um, same opportunities that students get at high schools who are interested in uh, pursuing um, collegiate education. Um, all three provisions we think are very important, the Naviance access, the um, equal visibility for job opportunities and apprenticeships, and the payment of uh, school credential and entrance exams if there's already a payment for SATs and ACTs. So we urge you to give this bill, a very important bill, a favorable report. I thank you very much. Thank you. Next, for two minutes, Caroline Yang, please. Um, hello, uh, my na last name is Caroline Jang. Um, Hi, go ahead for two minutes, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Caroline Jang, the Legislative Advocacy and Organizing Intern for Strong Schools Maryland. I recently graduated from UMBC this past December and currently on the road to becoming a school psychologist. And I'm here to testify in support of House Bill 652. The Blueprint for Maryland's Future outlines a system that can bring world-class public school education to our state's children. And at the end of the road is the ultimate measure of this foundation, college and career readiness. By passing HB 652, you all, the committee members, and the Maryland General Assembly can set the stage to strengthen and help existing policies, including the Blueprint, reach world-class college and career readiness outcomes for students. HB 652 will increase access to career and technical education opportunities for students. It requires local school systems to pay the student's share of certification costs the same way they do for AP, BSAT, SAT, or ACT exams. HB 652 will also increase economic opportunities by increasing the likelihood that more students will be properly qualified to go directly into jobs that they have tested and trained for as soon as they graduate. 
College and career readiness is the last and biggest measure of the success of the Blueprint for Maryland's future before students enter into the workforce or higher education. All the reasons I have just said, increasing access to career and technical offerings and increasing economic opportunities for students contributes to the successful implementation of the Blueprint and to the achievement of the world-class schools. And for those reasons, we urge a favorable report on House Bill 652. Thank you. Are there any questions? or Delegate Guyton or any of the witnesses. Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 652. And we are circling back and welcoming back Delegate Boatler with us. Hopefully we won't have any connection issues. Um, and so Delegate Boatler, House Bill 825. Let's try thank to say that. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Can, can you hear me okay now or? Yes. Okay, good, sorry about that. Um, okay. On House Bill 825, I uh, want to thank you, uh, you know, for the record, this is Delegate Joe Butler, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on House Bill 825. And this is to create a task force to evaluate uh, um, existing school civic literacy programs. This, this bill uh, aims to establish a task force for evaluating existing school civic literacy programs and requires a task force to evaluate these programs, determine strategy for enhancing long-term civic education and make recommendations <clears throat> and make recommendation for a plan for implementing a civic education program to the State Department of Education, the governor and the General Assembly. Um, there is some history to this bill. Uh, this bill actually has twice over the last 10 years passed this committee and actually passed on the House floor and um, got caught up uh, in those final hours over in the uh, Senate. Uh, I remember one year, I think it was due to uh, uh, a budgeting issue that went on. So it's, it's just something that we have done before. <clears throat> Knowledge of the government and how to become engaged in one's community is declining. And this starts with educating our youth. Building a vibrant democracy requires each new generation of citizens to embrace their responsibility to the national, now global commons. And um, Dr. Uh, Stambler from Yale University defines civic literacy as a knowledge of how to actively participate and initiate change in your community and the greater society. It is the foundation by which a democratic society functions. According to the Pew Research, only 28.5% of estimated eligible voters voted in either the Republican or the Democratic presidential primaries. Every year we do see a decline in the number of people that are actively even engaged in the political process. Civically engaged students have higher rates of satisfaction with college, higher GPAs and higher retention rates. They are also more likely to complete degrees than, they, <clears throat> than their less engaged peers. In a 2011 report, the National Conference of Citizenship reported that civic health matters for economic resilience. The NCOC study found that communities with higher rates of civic engagement recovered faster economically after the recession. One of the most basic civic duties in which citizens can engage in is voting. <clears throat> you know, we constantly are vote, trying to figure out ways to make voting as easy as possible, and yet the numbers are not coming up to where they should be. Voting numbers have steadily declined since the 60s. During the 2014 interim election, only 41.9% of eligible Americans voted. The 2011 Annenberg survey shows that more respondents, two thirds, knew the name of at least one of the judges on American Idol than knew the name of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. 
which was about 15%, or to three branches of government. Uh, I'm sure that most of you, as, as I have seen, we're always getting calls from constituents who don't even realize that the issue that they're dealing with belongs particularly to our state elected positions, where many times I know most of the issues that we seem to deal with seem to be on the on the county level or, this, or it would be on the city level. <clears throat> A Pew study found that less than half of Americans could identify which political party held the majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. Some facts about civic literacy. 64% of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. Most of us don't even know which party controls Congress at any given time. And half cannot describe the differences between the liberal and conservative views. Most cannot name their own members of Congress or their US senators. Civic education in grade school prepares students for a lifetime of engagement with their community and with their local and national governments. We will not survive as a people if this trend continues. In addition, the importance of civic knowledge to exercising citizenship can also be seen in the requirement that people applying for U.S. citizenship must pass a civics exam as part of the U.S. naturalization exam. Ten randomly selected questions about the U.S. government. Unfortunately, as further evidence of the lack of civic literacy among Americans, one in three native-born citizens cannot pass the, the civic questions on this naturalization exam. To ensure that justice and freedom in, exist for all members of society, Americans must engage in their communities and interest in the well-being of their fellow residents. To do so, they must be informed about the issues within their community and emphasize with those challenges by an unjust social structure and understand enough about the democratic process to be able to engage to make the changes that are necessary at times to help our fellow community members. This is why I believe that civic literacy programs need to be evaluated and implemented in our schools in Maryland and I urge this committee to give this a favorable port. Thank you. Thank you. There was one other individual, Vince McAvoy, to signed up, and he is not with us. So yes, I'll he's to... tied up, I think, in another committee right now. So Yes, he likes to testify. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I see Delegate Wilkins has a question. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and De Delegate Bowler. As you know, I really like this bill. I think it's very important. I'm usually your number two on it, um, but next time I'll, I'll make sure that I join you. Um, I just wanted to make sure I'm clear about the um, posture of the bill this year. Is, the, is this um, adding to or expanding the curriculum, or can you just state again um, exactly how the bill structure this year is going to... Um, ensure that the civic literacy um, happens in our schools? No, what, the, what this bill will do is establish a task force. And that task force is gonna evaluate the programs um, that exist at this time, and then make recommendations as to what would be the path forward. Some schools do a really good job of this. I've had some elementary schools in my district that Wow, I mean, they they just blow you away with what they're able to teach these kids about civics education. So the process is to evaluate and then come up with a way. You know, I'm not trying to say we have to do this or we have to do that, but we need to take a serious look at this. Um, we're failing our children. We're failing the future of this nation if we don't understand the structure of government that we've been given to operate in. Thank you so much for bringing this important bill. I appreciate it. Sorry, I uh, didn't get you to be that number two sponsor. <laughs> next time, next time. There you go. Are there any other questions for Delegate Boatler on House Bill 825? 
Okay, seeing none, Delegate Boatler, House Bill 827. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, <clears throat> once again, this is Delegate Boatler, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to um, bring forward this uh, bill, House Bill 827. Um, what this bill deals with, this is an important issue that is facing our children of handwriting instruction, access in grade school, and the positive benefits of this instruction in our children's education. Since the adoption of the Common Core in 2009, cursive writing was no, no longer required to be taught to schools and uh, to be taught to children in our elementary school. Learning both print and handwriting at a young age have been shown as beneficial for the child, um, the child's brain development, retention, and literacy in the long run. While cursive is a lifelong skill that is not just necessary for being able to read cards or historical documents, it is critical to the learning comprehension and retention and has been proven to help all students retain what they have learned. According to the New York Times writer, Susan Asher, Asherin, an occupational therapist, cursive is shown to improve brain development in the areas of thinking, language, and working memory. Cursive handwriting stimulates brain synapses and handwriting stimulates um, and synop, uh, I can't even say the word, the uh, sing, uh, be between the, the, the relationship between the left and the right uh, hemispheres in your brain, something absent from just printing and typing. The connection between the hand and brain is very powerful in young children. When they are writing, they are strengthening the synapses in the brain. Kathleen Harrington, a third grade school teacher from St. John's School in Massachusetts, where children are required um, where they are required to teach cursive uh, in the third grade. Um, mastering literacy is a key competence for success at a school and in professional life. With respect to quality, <clears throat> handwriting requires carefully reproducing the shape of each letter, whereas in typewriting, the motor program is not related to the shape of the letter. And as a result, no such grapho motor component is present. Hence, motor programs associated with handwriting provide an additional informative memory trace and may contribute to the representation of the shape of the letter. I know with my wife, who is a principal um, at a local school, you know, they are constantly um, doing all kinds of things to get the kids to, to grasp you know, the shape of the letters and they do it through various medium. And, uh, you know, it's very important because it does, it does help them. Um, it helps them a lot. This demonstrates that handwriting, which links rich sensory motor representation to perceptual letter shapes, improves not only writing, but also reading performance compared with typewriting. In line with this interpretation, Neuroimaging studies show that visual recognition of familiar letters activate not only the visual letters areas, but also the motor reasons, uh, motor regions of the brain. And another study from NIH, we believe such differences require further attention. In printed characters, graphic movement is not continuous. The gesture stops. There are repeated stops and starts of the pencil and the motor process is broken. Instead on the graphic motor plane, cursive is the writing style closest to the child's natural movements. Students mastering good handwriting and cursive is also the key to making sure different kinds of learners thrive in the classroom. Cursive is very beneficial to those with dyslexia. Um, and dysgraphia. That is something that I have had to deal with all my life is I am dyslexic. Uh, for these learners, cursive is the best option for optimal learning. States around the US have been recognized as missing instruction in schools. For example, Alabama passed a law requiring cursive in 2016. 
The same year, Louisiana passed its own cursive laws. Others like Arkansas, Virginia, California, Florida, and North Carolina also have similar laws. Texas is the largest state in which educators are pushing to bring back cursive writing in elementary schools. As of now, 21 schools in the U.S. require the teaching of cursive handwriting. While some have said the technology <clears throat> is the new direction in the classroom, it does not replace the learning benefits of taking notes on pen and paper. Also, not every child has access to computers. Learning to write and print in cursive levels the playing field for students in all schools. The learning benefits from children taking cursive are too great to overlook, and that is why I hope you will support my efforts to make handwriting in schools required to be taught in Maryland. Thank you, and I appreciate your time, and I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Boatler? I see Delegate Guyton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Boltler. I just want to say, first of all, you did a great job with your brain research. I love research, I'll know that. And everything you said was exactly right, exactly true. So I agree with the premise. You made a great argument why this is great for kids. I guess I'd like to hear more about what you are trying to do specifically in this bill, how you want to mandate, and, and I apologize, I haven't had a chance to read the bill. What is it that you're, that you're asking? Are you asking for... Uh, well, what we're asking, asking is, for a particular curriculum, or are you just asking for schools that are not currently teaching this to, to evaluate it? What, what is it you're asking us? Well, what I want done is to see that cursive is brought back into the elementary school up to grade, I think it's grade three. Um, so that's what we're looking to do. I'm not trying to tell them how to do it. They're the professionals. We've had it before. Cursive has been in the schools. Um, like I say, I know from seeing what my wife has done uh, in her school, I mean, granted, it's a private school and they have done an excellent job of, of you know, teaching these kids how to do cursive writing and you do see the benefits. I mean, she's got kids that are three and four year old that, that are writing to a degree and, and you know, they're doing quite well. Uh, they're able to read. They're, they're even learning a Greek language, which is also taught at, at, at the school. So, and so my wife has, you know, has pushed that cursive for years. Um, it's just sad to see that the public schools and in most cases have pulled away from it. But no, that's the ideal is to have them bring it back. Let's teach these kids how to use cursive writing. And I think it will, it'll go a long way to help us with some of the other problems that we're faced with in the schools. Thank you very much. Um, I absolutely agree with the premise. I'm not sure mandating it is the way to go, but I'd love to have more conversations maybe offline about how we can help. Make Thank you. Happen. Delegate Branch. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Delegate Bowler, for this bill. Um, my question um, to you is that I wanted to know, have you done any research on seeing if there was any connection between children with ADHD and also children with reading disabilities um, since they've taken the curse of handwriting and curriculum out of the school system? No, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, ha I have not done that type of research. I do know I'll come back again to from personal experience that um, that I've seen with my wife and uh, and her school, uh, you know, granted I will say it again, it is a private school, but she has helped kids that are you know that do have these problems in the classroom, and and actually this has helped them. Um, she does some other things related to it, uh, as far as uh, how to form the letters and things like that. Um, she has a very comprehensive program and it does help these kids, but I have not done any, I have not looked at any studies that definitively have said in these particular areas like, oh yeah, this really has helped kids. Okay, so thank you. And um, I, again, I just want to say thank you for the bill and considering that all of our children and all of us have to, you know, often use signatures. Um, and most kids nowadays can't even write in cursive. So thank you again for the thank bill. Thank you. 
Any other questions for Delegate Boatler? Okay, thank you, Delegate Boatler. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 827. Moving to Delegate Boatler, House Bill 848. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, actually, this is a bill that um, <clears throat> I believe I had this in last year. Um, uh, it didn't go anywhere, or, or maybe it was two years ago. It might have been two years ago, but I, 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 you know, this is one of those bills. Had we had this in play um, during this pandemic, I think it would have uh, it would have went a long way to help a lot of students, um, uh, you know, with their learning uh, abilities and 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 the ability to to learn on a virtual kind of uh, framework. Um, it's it's just sad to say that years ago, um, I actually and through this committee we we passed the virtual schools bill, and um, unfortunately a lot of the school systems never took it up, and and I think their attempt at uh, during the pandemic to push virtual out there was really not as successful as they had hoped it to be. So I'm hoping that you'll consider this bill. It is a good bill. Um, what this bill will do, <clears throat> this bill alters the definition of a public charter school to include a virtual learning program, requiring a virtual learning program of a public charter school to employ a teacher with the same certifications required by professional staff of the other public school. I am introducing this bill again because I believe it promotes school choice gives all kinds of learners, offers families flexibility, and provides an alternate option for schooling that is both accountable and rigorous for the students. Now, the definition of a charter school, a charter school is under contract with the school board in which all or, or a portion of its instruction is provided through means of the internet and the pupils enrolled in and the instructional staff employed by the school are geographically remote from each other. Virtual charter schools are publicly funded non-secretarian schools that are exempt from many of the regulations that apply to traditional public schools and that offer some of their classes online. You know, one of the things that when we had passed the original virtual school bill, uh, one of the things that, that was important in that bill is that the students did actually meet and that's the same thing here, even with these virtual charter schools, there is a point where the, the where the students will get together, they will meet, uh, sometimes they may, they may have a teacher that will uh, share instruction with a number of them, but they will meet for social benefits uh, as well. Because charter public schools, um, or charter um, schools are publicly funded, but they're independently run, autonomy is given to the teacher, and to the parents to craft an education for the students that accommodates and nourishes the individual optimal um, potential. Online charter schools not only provide equal access for all levels of socioeconomic standing, but very importantly, allow students who have disabilities or parents in the military who travel uh, for work to have this flexibility of continuity in education. K-12 and the Connections Academies are examples, are, um, are virtual schools that are used in 29 states across the country. Virtual charter schools have been successfully implemented in Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia, Wisconsin, and um, online charter schools are a growing market in the school sector, and these began back in early 2000. Maryland currently has 50 operating charter schools with over 22,882 children attending these schools. Virtual charter schools are beneficial because there's flexibility. As these are cyber schools, they can encompass both living classes set at a specific time and a self-paced class. Online charter schools offers freedom of choice and provides a maximum of flexibility for families. Unlike the brick and mortar schools, online charter schools can break the barriers of poverty. This state funded option would open up to all families, regardless of their ability to pay 
with more flexibility than our traditional schools. I think another thing to remember is that this can help overcrowding. We, we have a lot of areas. I know in the area of the 8th District, we have some real problems with overcrowding and, and you know trying to come up with the money to build schools fast enough for this um, is a very difficult process. And this is something that can aid in that. Issues such as bullying and school shootings give parents a reason to keep kids safe at home. The flexibility allows access to a quality education to children who need this individualized education plan as top tier athletes, for instance, those that are struggling with mental health issues and military families who travel and move frequently <clears throat> and many others who just wanna find a private learning environment more productive than sometimes the classroom. It also allows students to focus on certain areas of learning as some, as some um, charter schools specialize in the arts or science, teachers are still a vital component for the students' growth and in education. Inclusive, you can opt into the education program without any added cost. You can get the education for free, just as you would attend a physical charter school. Virtual schools eliminate time spent on transportation to school and the six hours spent at school. Rather, it presents an efficient individual alternative model of education. And I think it's important that in this committee, we have constantly strived to provide many ways for our children to get educated. And some kids learn differently than others. I have a son who, um, who has a form of autism and I'll never forget when I bought my first computer, I spent over $6,000 on this thing and talk about having buyer's remorse. When I drove away, I thought, what the heck did I just do? But I tell you what, if it wasn't for that computer, you know, he would not be where he is today. And he's extremely successful, um, you know, as an engineer. And it was because of the ability that he was able to adapt himself to that computer environment. School choice is an important aspect of educational freedom and ad adding a virtual component to the public charter schools gives another viable educational opportunity that prepares students for colleges and universities. So with that, um, I'd like to ask the committee to um, advance this piece of legislation and um, uh, pass it out with a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. And there is one individual, Amy Sparks, who will testify for two minutes, please, Ms. Sparks. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Amy Sparks. I'm a resident of Rosedale, Maryland, and I'm here today to support House Bill 848. About 18 years ago, I had to pull my two daughters out of this public school system due to bullying issues. They had just finished the fifth grade. I homeschooled them for middle school. I was worried about my ability to teach them in high school. But then in the ninth grade, we were given the opportunity to participate in the Baltimore County online public school pilot program. Even though the parents and students found success in this program, there were 120 of us. Five were home in hospital. This program was canceled abruptly after one year due to the Maryland law seat requirement. Let me mention that the families organized and pushed for laws to be changed which gave us the current virtual school bill, but it's still not what we needed. We were told it's a slow process. My family couldn't wait. We then made the decision not to return to the traditional brick and mortar school, but to continue in a private online school, Pearson's Online Academy. This was the best educational experience for our daughters and family. For instance, my one daughter had ADHD and was behind in reading. Her teachers were able to add extra reading classes and by the next year, she was back on grade level. As for my family, my husband worked a 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift and virtual schooling allowed him to be active in their lives and education. My daughters thrived in this virtual schooling environment and went on to receive Maryland senatorial scholarships. I am proud of my daughter's achievements. For example, my one daughter now works for a hospital and she designed and helped to maintain today the building's wireless network. This brings me great pride as I am a breast cancer survivor 
and I received my follow-up care in that exact building. As for my younger two children, we continued with Pearson Online Academy because it worked for us. I was concerned with my son going in the kindergarten that he would have like have some problems because they said, you know, um, he was advanced in math, but he was, you know, going into kindergarten. They allowed him to enroll in first grade math, but the other subjects in kindergarten level. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer, my children were in the third and fifth grade. I discussed- Marks, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up your testimony, please. Okay. Um, the thing that I want to say is that Maryland families need options. My son is now a graduate. He went through 14 years. I mean, he went through his entire education and graduated last year for, and now he's attending CCBC. He just, his first semester in CCBC in a brick and mortar situation, he has a 3.87 grade point average. His English professor told him that his grade level for writing, he wanted to use his papers to show, he said, you're writing at a level 400. So this is the success that I see that my children have seen. And I just want other families to be able to have this as an option. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Boatler or Ms. Sparks? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 848. Thank you. Next, House Bill 836, Delegate Learman. And there are a couple of folks signed up afterwards for two minutes each. So whenever you're ready, Delegate Learman. Uh, thanks so much, Madam Chair and Committee. It's great to be back with you today. Um, so this is the uh, Elijah Gorham Act. This bill will really help us um, ensure that our school athletic organizations are in the best position possible to respond to sports-related injuries, including life-threatening injuries. And this bill is dedicated to and named for Elijah Gorham, who some of you may know was a 17-year-old Baltimore City school student who tragically died after suffering a brain injury during a football game just this past September. Um, I wanna thank his mother and his father for stepping forward and working with us, as well as with the McNair, Jordan McNair Foundation on this legislation. So as amended, um, and there is a, a sponsor amendment, um, the bill requires each county to do a few things. Um, it basically requires each county boards, right, school board, to ensure that schools have AEDs, automated external defibrillators, and cold water immersion modalities on site and near the venue for all school sponsored athletic practices and events. Um, because you might have an AED locked in a nurse's closet or at the other end of the school from where the football field is, and it will do no good there. Um, it, by the time you get to it, it's too late. Um, this bill also says that our coaching staff, they need to be trained in how to use these AEDs and how to use um, the cold water immersion. Because again, if you have an AED, but no one knows how to use it, you might as well not have it. Um, it also requires coaching staff um, trained on AEDs, those staff who know what they're doing to be present at school-sponsored athletic practices and events. And it requires schools to develop emergency action plans for when things go wrong, right? When you are actually going to need the AED or the cold water immersion um, modality, that those emergency action plans exist, um, that they are posted online so that parents can know what's going to happen and that coaching staff actually rehearse them. And there's actually a video that's um, linked in my testimony of a school in North Carolina where the coach was able to save a student's life because he practiced, he'd done it before. Um, and then finally, this bill talks about what students themselves should be doing and how they can learn so that they can be advocates. So this requires our student athletes to be educated on the signs of heat stroke, concussion, brain injuries, and associated protocols so that they can look out for one another and for themselves. Um, that's, that's this bill in a nutshell. It is, I think, very common sense. I was frankly pretty surprised that this doesn't already happen at all of our schools um, because this can really be the difference you know, between a child living or dying um, and the difference between a school having the proper equipment and a suitable emergency action plan in place can really decide whether a student athlete's life is saved. Um, because those first few minutes after the student suffers a medical emergency are, that's what makes or break it, right? That's crucial. And so student coaches need to be trained. They need to have the equipment that's needed to save a life and they need to know what to do and be able to re react immediately. Um, so when we have strong laws to protect our student athletes and they're followed, we can save lives. I urge a favorable vote on HB 836. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next, Martin McNair for two minutes, please. You're on mute. Unmute, mute, sir. There you Thank go. you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of. Oh no. The father. Start over. You just froze up for a second. Now. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Martin McNair, the father of Jordan McNair and the founder of the Jordan McNair Foundation. Uh, I'm here to provide oral testimony in support of House Bill 836, uh, the Elijah Gorman Act. Since 2018, the Jordan McNair Foundation has been promoting education, awareness, and prevention of heat-related illnesses and injuries, as well as improving player safety in sports among coaches, parents, and student athletes. The Jordan McNair Foundation has always found it imperative to get legislation within athletic organizations so the student athletes can stay safe. Over the past two to three years, high school student athletes have been impacted by heat-related illness and injury and cardiac arrest more than student athletes at all other levels of play. While the Jordan McNair Foundation is primarily, while the Jordan McNair Foundation is primarily about educating uh, heat-related illnesses and injury, an intricate part of our mission is to promote overall player safety. Many parents contact the foundation regarding student-athlete safety after the loss of their loved one, who was also a student-athlete. I'm here today to impress upon each legislative representative the importance to tighten the reins on emergency action plans, which we call EAPs, heat acclimatization, and the trained use of automatic automated external defibrillators, or AEDs, athletic directors and trainers. Many injury and death incidents among high school student athletes had to do with the lack of developing an EAP for each athletic field or venue, failure to review the EAP or too much time lapse between practices of the EAP. The emergency action plan is the equivalent to a fire drill. Fire drills occur so that everyone will know what to do in case of a fire. All coaches, athletic directors and trainers need to read understand, and more importantly, practice the EAP so that everyone will know their respective roles to keep help. We lost you. Lost you for, for, for a second there. Can okay, you, am I back yet? Yes, you are. Can you wrap okay. up? You're going in and out, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we highly support the practicing of emergency action plans in March or early April before spring and summer practices, which is peak season for incidents and again in August before fall sports practices and games begin. The names of the high school student athletes are included with this testimony that have been affected, like my son Jordan McNair, and most recently Elijah Gorham, a high school football player who died in October 21 in Baltimore. On behalf of the on behalf of the Jordan McNair Foundation, Elijah Gorham's family, parents and student athletes across the state of Maryland, I strongly urge you to pass House Bill 836 in order to promote players and help save the lives of student athletes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNair. Okay. Next, William Robinson for two minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Maryland Athletic Trainers Association, I have, uh, urge you to support House Bill 836. Athletic trainers are experts in the field of sports safety, and we are happy to lend our support to this bill as it hits upon a key component of our advocacy, athlete safety with a focus on prevention. The MATA is excited that the sponsors have been willing to work on and accept our recommendations to further strengthen the language around AED access and ensure venue-specific EAPs. Just having a plan is not enough. If that plan is not exact, distributed, posted on site, and rehearsed by everyone involved, it is destined to fail. Even schools with athletic trainers on site are at risk. One athletic trainer cannot provide crisis level care by themselves. While that athletic trainer is performing CPR, who is calling 911? Who is getting the AED? Who is unlocking the gate to allow the ambulance access to the field? All coaches need to be well versed in the EAP. I've heard from too many of my colleagues that they have an AED at their school, but they have no access to it. It's locked in the nurse's office. It's kept in a different building. They're not allowed to take it out to the field. It's not available after school hours. This past year at Loyola Blakefield, a lacrosse player was struck in the chest and collapsed. There was an AED on the sideline and the player was shocked in less than two minutes. That young man is alive today because of the quick actions of the sports medicine team 
and because the AED was on site and available. Had it been locked in the nurse's office, like many are, he would not have survived. Every athlete in Maryland should have that access to an AED and the adults in place to implement the emergency action plan. Athletic trainers have front row access to the excitement in sports. Unfortunately, we also bear witness to the tragedy of sport, the unnecessary and preventable death of a student athlete. It's an experience no athletic trainer can fully prepare for and one that no parent should have to endure. Our organization's goal and my personal mission is to ensure that we legislate as much safety as possible. We must take every step available to avoid the human error and poor planning that can lead to the loss of life and disability. The MATA urges you to move this legislation forward and ensure the safety of all Maryland athletes. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Learman. Thank that you. concludes the testimony on House Bill 836. Thanks. Now calling House Bill 865, a local Howard County delegation bill that our very own Delegate Eversall will be presenting. And there are three witnesses who will have one minute each after our Delegate Eversall, who will do his best not to take 20 minutes. Delegate Eversall never takes 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I bring you uh, House Bill 865, a bill that was approved uh, by the Howard County delegation. Uh, free and appropriate education is something we hear a lot about. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have is a rather uh, careful process if a parent does not agree with the assessment for the services needed by a student who is getting an IEP. There are several steps that parents can take to appeal that decision, including appealing directly to the board, or uh, mediation, but in some cases, uh, the case will eventually end, in, end up in front of an administrative law judge to make a judgment. Uh, in the past, <clears throat> when that was brought, the burden of proof proving that the student needed the treatment was on the parent or the complainant in this case. Um, what this bill would seek to do is at that stage, at uh, the due process stage at the end, the uh, burden of proof would fall to the school system or the school board that the student needed the kind of uh, services they were suggesting or, uh, or they, that they were denying to the, the student in this particular case. Um, and with that, we have a couple of people who will tell you more about how they feel about it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next, Vicki Catronio, our school board member from Howard County. Good afternoon, Ways and Means Committee. I'm Vicki Catroni. I'm the chair of the Howard County Board of Education, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Board of Education Statewide legislative efforts to shift the burden of proof in special education due process cases have repeatedly failed as far back as 2013 due to unwarranted opposition by school systems. In Howard County, however, the board believes this shift would allow the school system to reinforce a culture of partnership and collaboration with our families. HB 865 is simply about just doing the right thing for our special education students and families. Simply put, school systems hold the fundamental responsibility to provide a free and appropriate education under the Individuals with Disabilities Act. As such, staff already prepares for meetings with parents on the IEP developed by the school and has access to all of the data and expertise on the student's progress. They already have the proof needed to show that the appropriate services have been provided. It is only fitting that the public agency, the school system, have the burden of proof that the IEP is not being met with fidelity. Moreover, most Maryland families do not have the resources to access the attorneys, specialists, and consultants needed to prove that the IEP is not being followed. HB 865 would level the playing field for our families. For these reasons, we urge a favorable report of HB 865 from this committee. The board and HCPSS commend the Howard County delegation for their unanimous support, the sponsor, Senator Katie Fry Hester, and the Howard County Education Associate association for their unanimous support of this effort as a pilot over the next five years. Thank you. Next, Colleen Morris, president of HCEA in Howard County. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. We believe that uh, HB, HB 865 bill will set right a process that is unfair to students receiving special education services in the Howard County public school system. My name is Colleen Morris and I'm the union president. At our monthly rep assembly, over 100 educators voted to support this bill, and I would like to briefly explain why. HCPSS has a burden of proof when it comes to termination cases for employees. 
Why? Because they have all the information at their disposal to make a case. All this bill does is something similar. It moves the needle of burden by 1% to the school system, a system, by the way, that is more experienced and has more access to the information needed to prove they are providing FAPE for a child than a family who is trying to prove the system is not providing FAPE. The suggestion that teacher workload will increase was discussed at our meeting, but the data from New York and New Jersey from when they shifted the burden of proof does not support these claims. However, just in case, we agree that there would be a sunset clause. Our educators believe this bill would be a step toward leveling the playing field and creating a level field is what public education strives to accomplish. We urge you to let HCPSS serve as a pilot program for Maryland on this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Ashley Van Cleef, please. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ashley Van Cleef. I'm a former special education teacher, a, a school system administrator, a school system attorney. Um, and now I'm an attorney who represents parents. And so I've seen both sides of the burden of proof and argued on both sides of the burden of proof, having been a school system attorney and now a parent's attorney. What this bill truly does is it brings in the spirit of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of collaboration and working together with families. I have, I'm sitting here next to me, a, a binder that's prepared for a due process hearing. This is what it looks like for the evidence that has to be prepared by parents to present in a due process hearing. And when we think about, there's this great amount of evidence that parents have to prepare and they have to be able to have that burden to prove their case. It is a substantial difficulty and burden on those families. And if we can shift some of that responsibility that the, the school system has to prove that what they've done is appropriate and has offered that child the appropriate services that they require, then we can take a little bit of that burden, as was stated before, off of the parents and shift it to the people that have had six and a half hours a day, that have all the experts, that have all the resources to prove that they've done what is appropriate for the child. So we ask for your support to help families to bring in that collaboration. Thank you. And I see a question by Delegate Griffith. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Uh, how can I say this in the form of a question? I love this bill. Uh, I was successful in getting the IEP bill through last year that uh, uh, requires timely IEP evaluations. Uh, and I certainly hope that I'm going to have an opportunity next year to try to duplicate this in Hartford County. Isn't that so? <laughs> That was, that was rhetorical, but we, we, we appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you for all of my wonderful Howard County folks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great to see you. you that concludes the testimony on House Bill 865. Next, House Bill 797, Delegate Lukey, and there are four folks after Delegate Lukey that will have two minutes, Delegate Lukey. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I'm very excited about this bill. This is a, a big deal bill to me. Um, and it's because I got my start in um, my path towards public service as a student, as a high school student, actually, I started getting involved with political advocacy. Um, and I've always felt very strongly uh, that students deserve a voice in our community. And in particular, in our schools. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in including all groups of people that are affected by schools and decision making about schools, including parents, which is why we put a parent on the State Board of Education, including teachers and including the students themselves who are most directly affected by the decision making that happens on local boards of education. As members of the committee know, many of our counties and our State Board of Education have positions known as a SMOB or student member of the board. In some counties, those SMOBs are given uh, nearly full, or even in the case of one county, full voting rights as, as if they were any other member of the Board of Education. In many counties, the student representative to the board is um, a non-voting member. They, they don't really have uh, an actual voice in decisions because they don't have a vote. We have for decades now made decisions about the existence of student members of the board, about their voting rights, um, about how they're treated on a county by county basis. We've, we've treated these decisions always as local decisions. I believe it's time to move beyond that. I believe it's time for us to acknowledge that students themselves have the right to have a voice in the education they receive. 
that while they're in school and fully capable of participating in decision making, they have the ability to elect one of their own to serve on every local board of education in the state of Maryland so that those boards are fully informed of the student perspective when they're making their decisions. I think it's time for us to set a minimum standard for the existence of student members of the board in every county. And that's what this bill does. Put simply, it would require that every local board of education have a student member of the board with not entirely full, but nearly full voting rights. Um, there are a number of amendments that we've been working on with advocates for the bill uh, that make sh uh, shifts to the bill. And, and so let me briefly mention those. Um, the uh, first amendment would replace the effective date from the bill <coughs> and move it to July 1st, 2023. Um, there's some clarifying language regarding the number of student members of the board. Um, there, the bill is intended to make sure there's one student member of the board with voting rights in every county. Um, it, recruit, it removes some other unnecessary language, clarifies that secondary students are able to elect their own student member of the board. Um, that's the, the broad practice in counties with elected student members of the board. And frankly, by the way, um, there was a conversation earlier on a bill about civics education. What better civics education is there than to allow students to actually participate in an electoral process, to have the chance to hear from candidates for an office and to vote for it themselves. Um, and finally, the amendments clarify that the election has to be an open election. Um, that is an election where instead of a delegate system, system, secondary students will have the opportunity to actually vote on the student member of the board. Um, so I know this is a paradigm shift for us. I know this is a, a new idea. We've always dealt with student members of the board as a local decision. But I think the time has come for us to acknowledge uh, that students themselves deserve a voice in the educational decision making that affects them so profoundly for the remainder of their lives. And I would urge a favorable vote. Thank you. Next, Henry Miser for two minutes, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and esteemed members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Henry Miser, and in addition to being a resident of Legislative District 29C in Calvert County, I am also an 11th grade student. Today, I am here to testify in unequivocal favor of House Bill 797. House Bill 797 calls for the implementation of student members, or SMOBs as we call them, on all county boards of education. This bill not only amplifies the student voice, but it amplifies the most important voice in our educational systems. It is without question that students are one of the biggest stakeholders in primary and secondary education. With this in mind, my question to you is why a student would not be included in decisions which impact their day-to-day -day lives in the Maryland public school system. As one of the biggest stakeholders, the student population of each county deserves a representative to be in the room where decisions are made. As a student leader involved in various organizations across the state, I've had the opportunity to work with many student members of boards of education. The devotion, professionalism, and enthusiasm that these student members exhibit is absolutely remarkable and is a further testament to their commitment to their constituents and their relentless work ethic. The student position on local boards of education have existed as far back as the 1970s. However, not all counties provide student members with the same rights and abilities. In some regions, a student member has full voting rights, while in others, none at all. If passed, this bill will ensure the student voice and education is heard and that the student vote is county in every county and every jurisdiction. The bill goes to show our students that their opinions on their education are valued and considered by their county and state. In consideration of keeping the student perspective in education, I ask that today you issue a favorable report on House Bill 797. Thank you so much for your time. For two minutes, please. Madam Chair, your mic wasn't working when you announced the name. Oh, sorry. Henry, thank you. Henry Bocum for two minutes, please. Good afternoon, honorable members. My name is Kevin Bocum. In addition to previously serving on a local school board, I'm now a member of the State Board of Education. I come here before you this afternoon to express my complete support for HB 797 and to ask the committee to offer it a favorable recommendation. 
The student members on the school boards are distinctly passionate individuals with vast applicable knowledge far beyond their years. On the Maryland State Board of Education, I have nearly full voting rights, similar to the goal of HB 797, encompassing personnel, regulatory policy, educational policy, statewide curriculum, orders, budget, and with the only exclusion of being certain negative personnel and certain appeals to the state board. It was a delight for me to work directly with student members all across the state during my years on the local and now state school board. Student members have regularly and impressively represented their peers on boards of education for decades and communicated a student perspective while enhancing the crucial role and jobs that boards of education play. The caliber of students and peers who serve in this role are generally amazing and has motivated me to do better as a student member. The boards of education success depends on the fact of student and community input going with parents, staff, and community members. It's critical to ensuring a well-productive board of education. While the board acknowledges and appreciates the views of all students in the system, the student member distinctly plays a vital role in ensuring that link between the students and those who serve them. The student member is also an invaluable source of information for both students and board members. Student members often successfully communicate and explain board policy better than board members and other staff. Students have the most and deepest enrichment within the school system, serving day to day and experiencing the results of policy. Students have been the most underrepresented group in education since antiquity. Despite being the most important stakeholder in education, students have been denied opportunities and methods to advocate for education. However, students have challenged this adversity and have continued to advocate. Our voices deserve to have an effect. They deserve to have the chance to not only be considered, but have weight. The world around us is changing, and students all throughout the country are eager to lead and influence it. It's important to remember that the student member on the board is just like adult board members. He or she will be a knowledgeable voice in making choices based on what is best for each of the county schools. On certain votes, the student Mr. member- Mr. Bokum, I'm gonna to have to ask you to wrap up your testimony, please. Got it. And I just wanna say as student member suffrage became more popular, I urge the committee to issue a favorable report on HB 797. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Tanish Gupta, please, for two minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair of Washington, um, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Tanish Gupta, and I'm the student member of the Board of Education for Washington County. This bill is important to me because of, it would accelerate the position of student member in Washington County far past where it is now, the place it should be. I've been in Washington County since I was eight. I saw the position, when I saw the position of student member existed, I, de I decided that very second I was going to run. Two weeks later, I did, and I won. I only want the best for Washington County, but right now, I can't do that. Let me paint you a picture. The email shortcut, which automatically sends emails to all board members and the superintendent doesn't come to me. I don't get 90% of the emails board members do. The picture of the board members in central office does include me. When I try to get reimbursement for going on school visits and speaking with students, even though it's written in policy that I can, there's no money set in the budget for it. Right now, I'm spending 10 to 15 hours a week in my position with no stipend or scholarship. I can't go to the conference in DC because there's zero cents in the budget set for me. I'm not invited to any MAVE committees because I don't have voting rights and they're against us because of local control. Then why does Montgomery County have full voting rights and Prince George's not. Are the students of Prince George's less qualified to serve on the board? Let me show you what I'm doing. I'm trying to remove classrooms to help students' mental health. I'm trying to get locks on bathroom stalls and working seats in every bathroom. This Tuesday, I want an amendment to get 3.5 more council positions as staff needers so our counselor to student ratio at some schools would be one to 600. Nobody made the motion. I couldn't make the motion. But the board meeting before that one, there was a 40 minute debate about masks. I organized student testimony to the county commissioners so our school system could have a fully funded budget. All the board members seem to love me for that but they'll wait until our official joint meeting to speak with them directly and publicly. And by that time, the budget for the county will already be finalized. I put in my all for this county because I want the best for it, but I'm not feeling the love back. My battles are twice as hard, so I fight twice as hard. I come to this committee and say, if you want the best for your students, support this bill. And to those doubtful of giving voting rights, because I know those people exist, I want you to ask yourself if the one person who spends more time in the school than every person on your board combined uh, can't vote, then please reconsider your qualifications to be a super board member. I urge this committee to leave a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. John Willems, please, for two minutes. Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Willems representing the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. Uh, first, uh, just to uh, assure the committee that uh, MABE takes incredibly seriously uh, the responsibilities of our student board members and student representatives. Uh, we conduct a separate uh, new board orientation for student members on an annual basis. 
and uh, we brief them on all of the same content uh, that we brief our other board members on, and we hugely appreciate uh, their role on our local boards. Uh, that said, as, as uh, uh, Delegate Lukey mentioned, this bill would be a paradigm shift, and I just want to stress that uh, we have anything but uniformity uh, as it relates to the composition, uh, compensation, uh, and, uh, and, and organization of our local boards of education in Maryland. We are, to the best of my knowledge, the only state in the country that has hybrid boards combined of appointed and elected members. Uh, we have uh, the urban uh, appointed board in Baltimore City, which is fairly typical nationwide. Uh, we have boards ranging in size pretty dramatically uh, from a handful of members to uh, more than a dozen. Uh, we have uh, the Prince George's County Board, which is uniquely comprised of members appointed by local government, uh, which is Mabe's only position related to local board composition is that we are concerned about conflicts of interest in that regard. Uh, but uh, that, that board, um, and that board is under uh, consideration for restructuring uh, as we speak. And for all these reasons, we just favor the local developed process of board comp uh, composition, including the role of the student member and student representatives. And so we oppose the bill uh, based on our strong support for the principle of local advocacy for reforms uh, on local boards of education. Uh, we have a board of education in the state that remains uncompensated at all. Uh, and, and many of you are familiar with local bills relating to the compensation of your local boards. And so there's just a huge amount of variation that's not reflected in, the, in this one size fits all approach of this bill. For those reasons, we request an unfavorable report on House Bill 797, thank you. Thank you, there are several questions and so I'll just go in order. Buck, Delegate Buckle, Delegate Griffith and Delegate Ebersaw. So Delegate Buckle. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess I have a, a, a question or maybe a series of one or two quick questions for um, for my friend, Delegate Lukey. You're obviously an, an incredibly eloquent spokesperson for this uh, concept and all of the students who testified are to be commended. I mean, they did a fantastic job there's no doubt that they are a, uh, a credit to their schooling and I'm sure an invaluable resource within their own communities. The only, you know, we heard Mr. Williams talk about local control. You know, that's a concern for many of us about maybe one size not fitting all. But I, I did have one substantive question and then one that perhaps maybe you'll find a little differently. You know, we've talked a lot in our legislature over the last year or two about how to address juveniles who, unlike uh, the three gentlemen we heard today, uh, that are obviously credits to to you know their families and, and credits to their schooling and are doing wonderfully. We have juveniles who aren't doing those things, uh, unfortunately, and they're having a tough time in life and they need some intervention. And we hear a lot about you have to uh, give them special breaks or you have to treat them differently because they're they're socioeconomic, not socioeconomic, their their sort of social development, their mental development, their emotional development is not. Uh, good enough is not advanced enough at 17 or 18 years old to fully appreciate the consequences of their actions. And as a result, they have to be dealt with differently or perhaps at a, at a less elevated level in the criminal system than what someone who is 19 or 20 or 21 years old would be. How do you jibe that with the concept of we're going to create a fully voting member uh, with uh, the exceptions you discussed uh, in a school board context. So we're taking, I mean, if kids' cognitive developments and, and socio-emotional developments are not good enough at 718 to get bear the full consequences of committing acts of violence, uh, serious acts of violence, how can we jive it with their level was good enough to be uh, a fully elected official, essentially, helping to govern hundreds of millions of dollars in budgets? I, I mean, frankly, I, I think it's a, a false comparison. I think they're two separate issues. Um, I think, you know, the decision making ability necessary to cast a vote um, is a different decision making ability uh, than what you're talking about. And I also think, you know, I rely on uh, the fact that we have long had student members of the board in this state um, and in some counties with nearly full voting rights or even full voting rights and the track record of those students has been consistently and absolutely clear. These are among the best informed, hardest working um, members of any board of education. Um, so, you know, I, I, I just 
think we have the track record to prove it. And I don't think that students in Allegheny County are any less capable of participating in educational decision making than students in Anne Arundel or Howard or Montgomery, where there are student members of the board with voting rights. And I appreciate that. I mean, I guess I would say that I agree with you that the two concepts are different. To me, it's a it's a lower threshold to suggest that you have the cognitive and socio-emotional maturity to understand that that harming someone else is 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 bad, is not acceptable, versus the the cognitive ability to really sit and, and do what sometimes people are forced to do. The three fellows who testified, I have no doubt that they probably put a tremendous amount into it and, and maybe better than, than some other regular board members. But we just have a difference of opinion about maybe how we can view those things. The second question I had, the last question, the uh, elections for the student school board member, uh, are they done via ranked choice voting? <laughs> uh, not in any county that I know of. Okay, um, I'm just suggesting yeah. there might be a possible amendment there for you know, the ranked <laughs> choice voting. That occurred to me, you know, so. Thank well, you very much. It's, yeah, it's that's not spoken to. It. As, as yeah. the, uh, the bill just clarifies that they have to be elected. It doesn't clarify the specific voting format. OK, and, and my you know, my opposition to it has nothing to do with the, the advocacy you've done and the three fellows who testified. And I'm sure almost all of them. I mean, they're they're excellent at trying to do what they're doing. It's just it's an interesting issue. So thank you. Okay, next, Delegate Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, my experience with, and you see them here, it's kind of a response to J Delegate Buckle's question right now, is that I have found in my years that student members sometimes are the hardest working members of the board. And there's a reason for that, not because they're necessarily better people, although in many cases that might be true, but because they have a bias to overcome and you hear that bias, you hear that bias in the questions being asked. And so Delegate Lukey, the question simply is, do you find that's also true that they work harder because they have to work hard to establish their credibility when they're there? I, I, yeah, I think, I think that's been part of my experience. Um, but also I think part of what happens with student members of the board, and you know, Kevin may be able to speak to this um, and the other um, folks who testified, um, student member of the board positions are, are time limited. You only get a year or at most two to serve on the board. So I find that, you know, the, the uh, students that are elected come in with an attitude of, well, if I'm going to get something done, I'm going to get it done quickly. And they work very hard at it. Um, and you see, I mean, significant policy change happening as a result. Um, and, and I think policy changes that many members of this committee would support, for example, our current student member of the board in Montgomery County, Hanna Oluni, um, has been pushing the idea of the creation of a, a county level graduation requirement in financial literacy. Um, and that was an issue that really wasn't on the table in Montgomery County before her election as a student member of the board. So, um, you know, these are these are these are folks that are getting a lot done in a short amount of time. And I don't know, Kevin, Henry, if any of you guys want to comment as well. Sure. Um I definitely want to say something. Class rank is something that the Anne Arundel um, County student member who has full voting rights did, and that's affected. Um, well, that will probably ultimately end up affecting millions of students um, because you know you make that one change because of the student member, um, and it affects every single person after. You look at the counties around Anne Arundel; only some of them have removed class rank. So there's a direct correlation with, with there. There is research done that class rank reduces. Um, and the removal of class rank reduces stress on students and the election of a student brought that to the attention of the board and then the board was able to get that change done and the board members approved the change and that was because the student member had voting rights you know i'm finding the same thing in my county except i have to go through board members i have to say will you propose this motion will you bring this up in committee i go to um, our lawyer and say that can you do this and everything gets delayed you know i brought this up back in December, November, and they said, well, no, I don't want to bring it up right now. And then I had to wait three months to make that change again, bring it up again after mass. He's like, oh, after mass. It's like, I, can't, I don't have the ability to bring up that change when I want to make that change. So did you want to say something? I saw you turn your screen back on. Henry, can you hear me? Did you want to comment? I saw you put your screen back on. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you so much. Just to echo uh, Mr. Gupta's sentiments, the situation is very similar um, in the county 
which I go to school in, which is St. Mary's County in Southern Maryland. Um, I also would completely agree with Delegate Lukey's um, sentiments about how these students, um, they only serve in most cases a one-year term. In some cases, um, they'll serve both their junior and senior year. So they will kind of have a two-year term to get their work done, um, but there's no certainty there. You know, you don't know whether you're going to win that election again. Um, and beyond that, I think it also, their hard work is just a testament to how dedicated these individuals are to making sure that they represent every single student. And they do that by going to the schools. I know our local SMOB, the very first thing she did is she made a point to visit every single school in the county, elementary, middle, high school um, in her very first quarter as student member of the board. So um, these are very hardworking and very. Thank you, Delegate Griffith. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Delegate Luke, for bringing this forward. Uh, my question is more technical. So I'm right now I'm looking at the makeups of the various boards of education in the state. Uh, 23 of the 24 jurisdictions have an odd number of members, uh, obviously to prevent ties. Now, obviously sometimes in the areas where student members do have voting rights on certain matters, you do occasionally reach tie. Uh, this would certainly uh, significantly expand the areas where you'd ha you would have a tie on the Board of Education. And this is passed this year, local boards of education will not have an opportunity ahead of time to adjust to that appropriately to prevent uh, gridlock in these boards of education. So I guess my question is, have you contemplated uh, the technical issue there by potentially pushing 23 boards of education into, into gridlock uh, unintentionally uh, without giving the boards of education an opportunity to adjust to this before it becomes law? Thank you for the question, Delegate. It's a, it's a good question. It's one of the reasons that the amendments that we introduced changed the effective date to July 1st, 2023, which would allow counties another legislative session before uh, this would fully go into effect so that they would be able to bring local bills to alter the size of local boards if they so chose. Thank you. Delegate Patterson. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And and I thank you, Delegate Loki, for bringing this legislation before us. Uh, I will uh, attest, I will concur with what you cited about the student member. Our student member is not only a student on the Board of Education, but he's also a candidate for commissioner for District 1. So he's already put his, uh, his uh, experience into practice. I do have a question regarding the um, information regarding different districts. For example, in my district, it cited that the board student would be elected in accordance uh, with the procedures established by the board versus that selected where we have it now, whether it's selected by the student uh, associates of student council. So are you open for amendments to the proposals that are there? Yeah, well, I'm always open to amendments on any of my bills, um, okay. um, Delegate. I, I think the, the the section that you're referring to, um, the election refers to the election procedure. So of how a student is actually elected, and um, under the bill, they would uh, under the bill with the amendments that that we're um, introducing, um, they would have to be elected through an election that all secondary students in the county would have access to. Right. Um, but there, there are multiple methods that counties use to to engage in voting. Some counties, you know, literally use the same election equipment that they use in regular elections. They just use it in the schools on, you know, small mm -hmm. election day. Um, some counties use a form of electronic voting. I mean, there, there's multiple options here. So this just leaves right. the voting procedures themselves up to the county board. Thank you. Thank you. Good bill. Are there any other questions for Delegate Lukey or any of the witnesses? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 797. Thank you. Next, mm -hmm. House Bill 857, Delegate Resnick, and there are eight witnesses who will have two minutes each after you. So whenever you're ready, Delegate Resnick. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of Ways and Means. It's a pleasure to be before you for the first time this session. First and only time I will add, so uh, be, be kind. Um, uh, I'm pleased to present HB 857. This bill will allow schools receiving concentration of poverty school grant program funding under the blueprint 
to continue to receive free breakfast and lunch for all students at the school. School meal meals have long been the primary tool for the Maryland Department of Education when combating food insecurity in students. However, last, less than half the students who qualify eat both breakfast and lunch. Barriers like cost and the stigma of accepting meals are keeping students away. Additionally, the difficulty of applying for free and reduced priced meals means that many families who would qualify aren't enrolled. The bill before you would reduce both the stigma of receiving a free meal at school and the application difficulties that prevent many students from receiving the meals. HB 857 solves these problems in two ways. First, it extends the Universal School Meals Program funded by ARPA by one year, providing every student in every Maryland school a free breakfast and lunch as we continue transition to a post-COVID environment, the way we have been doing it for the last two years. And second, we require schools that qualify under the Blueprint CP guidelines to provide every student with a free breakfast and meal, uh, free breakfast and lunch in perpetuity. It has been shown time and again that students are better able to focus and learn when they're not hungry, but it can be very difficult to put your pride aside and admit that you don't have enough food at home. If every kid is given a meal, then no one has to feel singled out. It also covers the kids the kid who was running late and didn't have time to eat breakfast, or the one who left their lunch at home. The other stigma that this bill would help erase is what is commonly referred to as lunch shaming. This is when a student is singled out for not having the money to pay and therefore is given a more inferior meal like a cheese sandwich. Something that everyone else in the lunchroom knows what it is and what it means. We have seen over the last two years through the assistance of both the state and federal government that we are capable of reaching and feeding all of our kids. When school buildings uh, had to close at the beginning of the pandemic, we were able to not only provide, continue to provide these meals to kids, uh, but we were able to deliver them to their homes. Districts were able to pivot very quickly and make sure that students did not go hungry even during virtual learning. With the continuation of some of these federal programs, it is not outside our means to keep providing meals free of charge to our students. While it is my hope to someday be able to do this for all of our public schools, we are starting out by tying this to the blueprint and the CP grant program. I want to address the fiscal note very carefully because I know that everyone comes before committees and says the fiscal note is wrong, but in this case it's literally wrong. I worked with DLS and the budget analysts on my committee on appropriations all summer to get exact numbers for what, in order to uh, accurately portray what the cost here will be. Uh, in consultation with the fiscal note writer today, there was a, an assumption made that was not the intent of the bill. So let me tell you what it actually costs, and then I'll tell you what that assumption is and how we're gonna fix it to get the fiscal note in line. Without the one-year full extension, the, bu the, the budget cost for uh, the first year, fiscal year 23, is about $2.8 million. By fiscal year 27, we rise to just over $14 million. This is in line with CP schools expanding to, the, it's the CP grants program expanding to more schools over the, um, over the, the course of uh, the next five years. Um, the single year uh, continuation for next year, fully admit it is very expensive. It is $200 million, but it is a one-time cost and one that I think is very necessary so that we can continue this program as we ease out of the COVID restrictions. The problem that we had with the, 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 uh, the fiscal note is, is, a, is a problem that I think we need to just clarify with a sponsor amendment. Um, Essentially, it is a question of whether or not we will continue to accept federal dollars through the CEP program or fully fund the program ourselves. Uh, it was my intent to make sure that state dollars were last dollars taken and that we continue to force the, the schools to get as much federal money as possible. So I think a clarifying amendment would easily fix the very high estimates that were in the fiscal note. Um, in addition, there is before you another sponsor amendment. Um, the original estimates of 2.8 million for year one and 14 million through year five uh, included both breakfast and lunch. 
Uh, in drafting the the legislation, breakfast was excluded. So we want to we have that sponsor amendment in front of you to include breakfast as part of the original cost. Um, that was you know that's the bill, and that is what I would very much appreciate for any of you to to look at. I'm open to questions, and I really do hope that in this bill we have a favorable report out of this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Julia Gross, for two minutes, please. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Julia Gross. I'm here to express support of HB 857 on behalf of Maryland Hunger Solutions, which is a statewide nonpartisan nonprofit working to end hunger in Maryland. Uh, before starting, I'd like to thank uh, Delegate Resnick for his attention to this critical issue and the committee for your previous support on expanding access to school meals, um, legislation to front, uh, fund breakfast in the classroom, remove, reduce price co-pays, eliminate meal shaming all came out of this committee. Um, and help to feed more kids in Maryland without stigma. So this bill really just uh, takes the next step to advance that goal. Um, we know that school meals have always played a critical role in ensuring kids have the nutrition they need to grow and thrive throughout their childhood. Uh, but because of the barriers our current tiered payment system creates, too many kids are left out and lose out on important educational opportunities because they're distracted by hunger in the classroom. For the past two years, we've experienced the benefits that come from a system where students have access to healthy meals without having to justify or prove that they need them. Um, and while that federal support is ending, uh, families who are struggling before and during the pandemic are still struggling now. Um, and many of them won't qualify for assistance under the system we'll return to, but will be uh, benefit from life in a life-changing way from the support this bill provides to them and their children. Uh, so we know, also know that the school nutrition staff have been the true heroes during the pandemic and done an incredible job uh, to meet the students' needs um, and continue serving meals, but they're also still facing extreme challenges and providing them with the resources outlined in the bill will help support their oper operations during the next year. Um, and then the last thing I'll have to say is while we look forward to a day when all students across the state get access to a healthy breakfast and lunch at no cost permanently, uh, we're really excited about the uh, changes and the step forward that this bill will take us in to ensure that less kids go hungry, more kids succeed academically, and more families are supported throughout the lengthy recovery process we'll experience. Um, so this is not only a good policy, but a smart investment and the right thing to do. And uh, that is why Maryland Hunger Solutions respectfully urges a favorable report. And thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Next, Fania Yangarber for two minutes, please. Hi, I am Fania Yangarber, Executive Director of Healthy School Food Maryland, a Montgomery County-based advocacy organization that has worked for a decade to amplify student and parent voices calling for improvements to school meals. I'm testifying on behalf of over 6,000 parents and on behalf of the Food and Nutrition Subcommittee of the Montgomery County Council of Parent Teacher Associations. We strongly support HB 857. Many problems affected school meals even before the pandemic began, many of them rooted in the inequitable three-tiered financing structure of the National School Lunch and School Breakfast programs. In an average MoCo high school, the cafeteria seats only 25% of the student body, there is only one lunch period, and around 40% of the student population is eligible for free and reduced meals. Confirming each child's eligibility at the cash register slows the line down, eats into the students' lunch periods, and deters even students with highest need from participating in the programs. And the eligibility waivers in place since the beginning of the pandemic have helped food get onto the trays of students who wanted it and eliminated some of the humiliation and stigma that kept kids out of the cafeteria. HB 857 ensures that breakfast and lunch will remain free for all Maryland students next school year. This bill aims to ensure there is increased state funding for free school meals in high poverty schools across the state. An estimated 40 to 50% of Maryland schools may become eligible as the bill phases in year by year to increasing numbers of schools. HSFM's annual statewide surveys of the school food environment in every Maryland district since 2016 showed that when the state invested in school meals, quality and subsequently participation improved. Data confirms that students who participate in school meal programs have improved nutrition, improved overall health and long-term health outcomes and improved academic achievement. This is crucially important legislation. We urge a favorable report on HB 857. Thank you. 
Next, Samantha Zwirling for two minutes, please. Good afternoon, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the committee. I'm Samantha Zwirling here on behalf of MSEA, representing 75,000 educators across the state. Many of MSEA's legislative priorities are here before you today, and you'll be hearing from our president on other bills. Feeding student has been a priority of MSEA, and we urge you to pass House Bill 857. This bill would ensure that all students in community schools have access to meals at no charge to their families. This bill smartly builds on the work of the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, which we thank you all for passing and for continuing to support during the implementation. As a reminder, community schools are a public school that establishes a set of strategic partnerships between the school and other community resources that promote student achievement, positive learning conditions, and the well being of students, families, and communities. The purpose of these schools is to help students and families overcome the in school and out of school barriers that prevent them from learning and succeeding over the course of their lives. Hungry children cannot be expected to fully engage in their learning if they're distracted by empty bellies. Under the blueprint, we are taking existing public schools who have been identified in these communities of concentrated poverty and designating them as community schools. These schools exist all across the state. To give you a sense, this school year, 288 schools were designated as community schools, and that will only expand as others has mentioned. As Delegate Resnick mentioned, this bill would also eliminate meal shaming, which we know has an impact on student mental health. As you've heard before in this committee, educators are always working to feed their students. Many never left the school buildings during the pandemic and continued to distribute meals. As you know, and I've heard here before, educators spend hundreds of dollars per year on supplies. Most keep snacks in their desks or even pay for the meals if necessary outright. Universal meals as outlined under this bill would reduce that burden on educators. Thank you for, to the committee for your continued focus and dedication to feeding students in our state. And we urge a favorable report on HB 857. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Laura Stewart for two minutes, please. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Stewart and I'm here to represent Free State PTA which represents over 40,000 volunteer members and families in over 500 public schools. Free State PTA is composed of families, students, teachers, administrators, and business, as well as community leaders devoted to the educational success of children and family engagement in Maryland. And we strongly support HB 857, which aims to expand access to school meals by requiring schools um, receiving a pure per pupil grant under the Concentration of Poverty Grant Program to provide school lunch at no cost for all of their students. Additionally, it will um, extend um, the cost of breakfast and lunch to be covered for all Maryland students during 20, 2022 and 23 school year. You've heard great arguments so far about why this bill is worthy of support. I would like to highlight a couple issues. Well-nourished bodies, and brains um, are part of learning recovery. Next year will be pivotal in recovering from the devastating effect of COVID-19 on our Maryland students. And they need to be given the best chance to uh, continue in that learning recovery. I also want to point out that the sandwich of shame is real, not just rhetoric. I know because when my 17 year old child was very young, I made the unforgivable mistake of letting his account go too low and he was handed the cheese sandwich, the sandwich of shame. He came home in tears that day, hungry and upset. He literally came up to the door in tears. That opened my eyes and many Maryland students fall into that category of food insecure, even if they don't fall into the free and reduced lunch category. So this is worthy for us to take this up in the future, not just for next year. I'd also like to uh, point out that uh, the students of Maryland need this bill and we fully support it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Barbara Harrell for two minutes, please. Good afternoon. And thank you for allowing me the time to present um, this testimony. I am presenting for the Maryland School Nutrition Association. Um, the Maryland MDSNA represents thousands of school food service employees across the state of Maryland. 
who served millions of meals to our students last year. As president of the association, I'm honored to be able to provide this testimony on their behalf. As we are committed to our students and to their nutrition, we strongly support the concepts and spirit of House Bill 857. We believe that the spirit which aims to add to expand access to school meals for all students is exemplary. We believe universal meals should provide an equal playing field for all students, because as we all know, a hungry student cannot learn. We are unable to support this bill as written with the stipulation that schools receiving a per pupil grant under the Concentration of Poverty Grant that are eligible for CEP must apply for CEP. Schools that have a lower direct certification certification number of students will suffer from the loss of reimbursement if they are a CEP school. This may also affect Title I or Comp Ed funding for schools. If the school loses funding in Title I Comp Ed or federal reimbursement, our association would propose that these schools be exempt from the stipulation to apply for CEP. This does not mean that we would um, consider these schools not eligible to serve meals at no cost, just not through CEP. We would also ask that the state provide public school funding equal to the distant difference between the federal reimbursement for a free lunch and the full price of the lunch for each student who is ineligible for a free or reduced price lunch and then receives lunch. The pandemic has brought increased attention to all of our um, to our unacceptably high number of uh, Maryland families that have struggled with food insecurity, which has only grown over the last two years. We would ask that this amendment be added, making all students eligible to receive free meals with the state paying the difference. I appreciate your time in allowing me to testify for this bill. Thank you. There were two other folks. I don't see them in here, but they submitted written as well, Roberto Malera and Laura Hale from the American Heart Association. And Maria Yu, I don't believe is here yet. She was stuck in class, um, so she couldn't make it, but she supports the bill. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Resnick. That's House Bill 857, uh, um, concluding that bill. Now calling House Bill 890, Delegate Lewis. And there are about nine folks after Delegate Lewis who will have two minutes each to testify. Is Delegate Lewis ready? Yes, I am here, my apologies. Okay. Whenever you're ready, Delegate Lewis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. I'm proud to introduce House Bill 890, and I urge the members of the committee to provide a favorable report on this bill, which has no fiscal note. Uh, we are in what is currently being called the Great Resignation, where workers of all classifications are leaving their jobs either because they aren't provided a living wage doing purposeful work or because the working conditions are simply unbearable to their professional and personal aims. Our educators are not immune to this trend. A survey of over 4,000 public school employees, including teachers, education support staff, and administrators found that over 96% of educators say staff shortages are a serious concern and 60% of educators say they are more likely to leave their profession or retire earlier than they planned due to the pandemic. Our work through the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, among other legislation, are all going to help address these challenges, but we have more to do. Citing the same survey, 61% of educators said that they would be somewhat or much more likely to stay in the profession if class sizes could be reduced, as well as another 90% said the ability to reduce class sizes would improve their working conditions. To help address these issues, it is time that we ensure our state's educators are given a voice when it comes to the size of their classroom. As of right now, Maryland is one of nine states in the nation where it is illegal for school systems to discuss the subject of classroom size during collective bargaining negotiations. The fact that class size cannot even be brought up during collective bargaining limits our educators' ability to manage their classrooms 
and ultimately affects their ability to give our children the individualized attention they deserve. Escalating workloads and rising class, rising class sizes are becoming unmanageable for our educators and at a bare minimum should be included as an option for negotiation. Further, as our local governments approve new developments for housing, it is our hope that this bill will ensure local governments have some skin in the game as it relates to where people will live, which schools their children will attend, and whether they can ensure a quality education with individualized attention for all of Maryland students. I'm thrilled to join President Boast of Maryland State Education Educators Association, a host of Maryland leaders, including Congressman Hoyer, Congressman Brown, Congressman Trone, who submitted written testimony uh, to the committee in support of this bill, and my co-sponsors uh, for this bill. I urge the committee to give a favorable report to House Bill 890. Thank you. Uh, John King, for two minutes, please. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and thank you, Delegate Lewis, for sponsoring this important bill. As a teacher, principal, former United States Secretary of Education for President Obama and current Montgomery County Public Schools parent, I'm deeply concerned about the level of burnout we're seeing among public school teachers, and I strongly urge you to support House Bill 890. I know the crucial role that teachers can play in students' lives because teachers Save mine. Both of my parents passed away when I was a kid, my mom when I was eight, and my dad when I was 12. I struggled in high school like many kids who've experienced trauma, got in a lot of trouble, I actually got kicked out of high school. What saved me was phenomenal public school teachers and a school counselor who gave me a second chance. Every child in Maryland should have the same chance I had, but our teachers can only make opportunity real for students if we ensure their voices are heard. As you already know, Maryland is only one of nine states where it's illegal for educators to discuss class size at the bargaining table. A recent survey by MSCA showed that more teachers are considering leaving the profession today than before the pandemic, but 61% of teachers said they would be more likely to stay in the profession if class sizes could be lowered. Teachers know that manageable class sizes are critical to their ability to address each of their students' unique academic and socio-emotional needs. And research confirms the importance of smaller class sizes, particularly for historically underserved students. Staffing shortages are already reaching crisis levels, and Maryland students can't afford to lose any more talented and driven teachers, teachers like the ones who saved my life. For these reasons, I urge a favorable report on House Bill 890. For two minutes, former member of this body, Aruna Miller, hello. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and the members of the committee. Thank you, Delegate Lewis, for your leadership on this bill. It's a great honor to be back in the Ways and Means, the first committee I had the honor of being a member of when I served in the House of Delegates. My name is Aruna Miller. I'm not a teacher but it was my teachers who taught me English when I came to this country as an ESOL student. And it was my teachers who reminded me every day that I could be anything that I wanted to be. And I believed them. I know teachers today are enduring great challenges daily in their classrooms. I know this because I've listened to my own daughter who's a public school teacher and I've made calls throughout the state and listened to other educators and support staff. Every one of them has expressed that while their profession is deeply rewarding, it is taking an emotional toll as they continue to see teacher attrition at alarming rates. And that overcrowded classrooms do have a direct impact on their ability to be an effective educator. There are a host of actions that the state must take to preserve and protect Maryland's world-class education system. I thank you for passing the blueprint and look forward to having it fully funded and implemented. Today, I hope you'll take another step, passing House Bill 890, which allows teachers to have a say in class size. The greatest danger in these extraordinary times is to act with yesterday's logic. For today's dedicated teachers, 
and the future of our state, our young students, who can be anything that they want to be, I respectfully ask the committee's favorable report on House Bill 890. Thank you. Cheryl Boast, please, for two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Atterbury and members of the committee and guests. I want to first thank Delegate Lewis for putting this bill forward, which will help our educators at least be able to come to the table and have a discussion about class size. As you heard, class size is now a topic that is illegal based in Maryland law. We want the opportunity to come up with creative solutions to address workload and the needs of our students. So you've heard the survey information um, from the previous uh, people who testified. I wanna tell you the personal side of this. As a fourth grade teacher at a Title I school in Essex, Maryland, I had classes sometimes of 20 and sometimes classes of 30. In a class of 30, I'm a facilitator. I'm trying to make sure everything runs on time, people have what they need, and that's what I'm engaged in. Trying my best to call all parents, grade all paperwork, make sure field trips are running, make sure that people need to go to the nurse, social emotional needs are taken care of. People and things will slip through the cracks. When I had classes of 20 to 23, got to know the students, got to know their families, was able to make connections, find out where their learning deficits might be, see where they're accelerating and how they can be get enrichment. It truly does make a difference in the way that I and my fellow educators can educate our students the best way. We need to have the ability to come up with creative solutions for this. What might work in an elementary school might be very different than what works in a high school. But right now we are silenced on this topic. And I'm asking you to take the gag off of our mouths and let us at least have the discussion on class size. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next, Kelly Hope for two minutes, please. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm a teacher in Baltimore City. Um, I teach in a high school and I'm currently responsible for 146 students in four sections daily. Some of my colleagues have between 250 and 300 students that they're responsible for. If a student is absent, I'm expected to call home. Yesterday, I had 48 students absent. So all those calls did not get made. Along with contacting homes for attendance, I am also expected to create engaging daily lessons, provide modifications for accommodations to the lessons for the various levels of students in the class, grade with feedback, attend IEP and 504 meetings, attend department meetings, and much more. Smaller class sizes for me would mean that I would have more time to build relationships with my students and their families. Grade papers in a timely fashion and provide more lesson modifications to engage all my students. Reducing class size will reduce the burnout of teachers and increase tension re um, teacher retention. Improve my instruction, provide more individualized instruction for my students and build stronger relationships with the students and their families. Stronger relationships with students will help reduce the effects of adverse childhood experiences, in, um, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Nathan Farrell, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Nathan Farrell, and I'm a Baltimore City Schools teacher and District 44 resident. I am very grateful for this opportunity to address the committee. I apologize for the announcement, I'm in school. During my 16 years as a high school teacher, I've worked in both Howard County and Baltimore City Public Schools. In both settings, I personally experienced the immense pressure of teaching class sizes that exceed 30 students. For my first nine years of teaching in Howard County, I regularly had classes with 30 or more students in a room. When a teacher experiences student loads over 150 students in an academic session, the ability to grade, give high quality personalized feedback, complete parent and family contacts uh, and address student progress uh, with families and students is nearly impossible and it's certainly unsustainable for most educators. In Baltimore City Schools, student class sizes in conjunction with the limitations of the physical space of classrooms in aged and deteriorated buildings like the one I work in has led to pretty unimaginable conditions. In my current school, 
we have both middle and high school classrooms with over 30 students and instructional spaces that measure, measure barely 25 by 25 feet. I don't know if you can see my camera here, but I wanna be clear, my classroom has a defunct elevator shaft and it exposed pipes and I can barely fit my students in here. My current classroom is very difficult to walk around and navigate with this many kids in it. Aside from being a health hazard during a pandemic, the amount of students in my classroom very limits, severely limits my instructional strategies and educational outcomes. As a summer school teacher in Baltimore City Schools, I regularly have rosters that exceed 40 students. During the summer of 2020, I had one roster for a virtual classroom, myself as the sole instructor, giving live virtual instruction every day to 67 students. These absurd realities are only possible because school district leaders are not required to develop staffing models that support smaller class sizes, thus allowing school-based instructional staff to meet the academic and social and emotional needs of our students. For these reasons, I ask the committee to issue a favorable report on House Bill 890. Thank you. And thanks for taking the time to come today in the midst of teaching. Frank Soda for two minutes, please. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Frank Soda, and I am a 15 year veteran Baltimore County Public School educator speaking in support of House Bill 890. I'd like to speak with you about observations and experiences related to my current role supporting teacher mentors and new educators. Educators juggle creating safe and effective learning environments, mastering instructional delivery models, individualizing instruction, and meeting the social emotional needs of students, while also addressing student and family trauma, just to name a few. These are great responsibilities, and they are difficult for our most veteran educators. Now imagine accomplishing these things as a new educator, and now imagine doing all of this without a single day of formal educator preparation. These are the teachers I help to support and at rapidly growing rates. Educator shortages are real and have reached a critical point in most school systems. Alternative certification avenues are on the rise and we have many local community members stepping up to fill the void in our schools. They need time and adequate supports to find success. I spoke just this week to a teacher mentor who shared that one of the teachers they support is resigning at the end of the school year. The teacher feels that she is failing her students. This is not an ineffective teacher. This is someone who forms positive relationships with her students, goes out of her way to provide meaningful feedback and reflects on daily instruction. Her mentor and principal agree that she is making progress and gains, but having 29 students in her elementary classroom while juggling the many expectations placed on her shoulders, taking graduate courses at night to become fully certified and caring for her own children has led her to the conclusion that remaining in the classroom comes at too high a cost. She is not failing her students, but in a way the systems we have in place are failing her and many other passionate educators. As a veteran educator, I can tell you firsthand that every student on a class roster multiplies workload and eventually starts to diminish the capacity of our educators to provide instruction and services necessary to impact student learning and achievement. We must use every tool available to retain educators, including the issue of class size. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Christy Lynch for two minutes, please. Greetings, Madam Chair and honorable members of the House, and Ways, House Ways and Means Committee. My name is Christy Lynch and I'm a special education educator in Prince George's County Public Schools. Today, I am providing testimony in support of House Bill 890, a bill that will provide educators with larger voice on the issues of class size. I am a middle school special education educator with over 20 years teaching experience. I currently co-teach with a general education teacher in, a math, in math classes. During my years of service, I have continued to watch as class sizes increase every year. I have personally seen my class sizes in the special education setting expand from 15 to 20 students and now to 30 students. I teach students who struggle with basic math skills, who need specialized and individual attention in order to strive to thrive in the academic setting. With continuously increasing class sizes, it becomes even more challenging to implement IEPs 
that ensure that I meet the needs of the diverse learners. The most heartbreaking thing for me is when a student is asking for more help, additional help, and I'm unable to provide it because of the number of students I serve. Increased size, class size also affects the ability of educators like myself from collaborating with parents and completing tasks like grading and submitting reports and compliance requirements. We often hear concerns on providing support for our students and educators, especially our students with special needs. One of the ways we can best help our special education students and educators that work with them is by allowing class size to be an allowable subject of bargaining. We're not asking for caps, but we just want an opportunity to have our voices heard on issues that detrimentally affect our classrooms and students. Our desire is to be able to provide our students with the individualized attention they need to build their confidence and for them to be successful in school and in their lives as they move forward. I kindly ask the committee for a favorable vote on House Bill 890. Thank you for hearing me today. Zachary Carey, please, for two minutes. Hello, first off, thank you, Delegate Lewis and others for championing this bill. Um, my name is Zachary Carey. I'm a middle school science teacher in Baltimore City where I've taught for 12 years. I'm also the middle school science content specialist for Teach for America. So I work with every first and second year teacher uh, teaching science coming into Baltimore City through the Teach for America program. Um, as other people have said over the last several years, I too have experienced uh, class size increases to the point where right now my classes are up to 38 students. 38. We're talking about eighth graders conducting science labs, right? And I'm sure that some of you guys have kids and I, I just want you to think about 38 of your wonderful kids with their friends in a science classroom. I think a reasonable person, regardless of experience in education, uh, can, can understand that creates issues. Um, and this is not taking into account that my classroom wasn't built for 38 students, let alone it's not a science lab. Secondly, I have 15% of my students that have specific learning disabilities, and 30% of my students are English language learners. I'm the only person in that classroom. Okay. Um, Regardless, I try to overcome these things each day, um, but I think the things that we agree that extraordinary teachers do, it's difficult to do in that setting. Now, um, I'm a teacher with 12 years of experience that's kind of excelled for over a decade. I work with teachers, they're in their first and second year, and I, I really just don't know how we can retain those people or attract new people to come into that type of setting. And the reality is that we're not. Um, over 50% of my first years this year that I'm working with have left before the year ended. And many of my second years are thinking about new jobs, okay? We're not asking again uh, for, for class caps. We're simply asking to talk about this issue that every teacher who I've ever met wants to talk about. Um, I think we can agree 38 is too much. Let us talk about it and please support House Bill 890. Thank you for your time. Finally, John Willems as unfavorable, please, for two minutes. Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Willems representing the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. Uh, the committee has made written testimony. Um, look, it's very difficult to argue with the merits um, of anything that has been said in support of the negative impacts of large class sizes in crowded classrooms. And MABE works um, in, in close partnership uh, with MSEA and other education advocacy groups on any number of issues related to improving uh, the conditions of, of learning in the state. Uh, that said, uh, for reasons that would take longer than two minutes, uh, we just spent the last five years or so uh, studying education reform in Maryland and hired a national consultant. Uh, and the blueprint is alarmingly in some respects based on a premise that class sizes should increase, not decrease. Uh, the, the blueprint does not fund additional staff positions commensurate with reducing class size. Uh, the blueprint focuses on initially giving raises to the existing cadre of educators, and there is little to no concerted effort to address the facility demands uh, driven by the blueprint, particularly to provide full day pre-K for three and four-year-olds, uh, which will have an enormous impact on square footage 
allocations and, and staffing and crowding in our elementary schools. Um, that sounds like a lot of bad news, uh, all under the mantle of the blueprint, which is kind of disturbing for me to hear myself say. Um, but smaller class sizes are not supported uh, either in the operating or capital budget projections of Maryland currently. So while it may feel good to add this as a permissive topic of bargaining, it is unlikely to have any meaningful impact uh, other than uh, perhaps uh, to uh, provide uh, boards the incentive to provide bonuses, um, combat pay, if you will, for teachers in crowded situations, uh, which there may be some merit to, uh, but that is not solving the problem. And so the concern is that while this bill addresses a very serious issue, it uh, will not in fact uh, solve uh, any problem and will really complicate matters at the bargaining table uh, as the written testimony emphasizes. So for those reasons, we request an unfavorable report on this bill. Thank you. Several questions. Uh, we'll begin with the vice chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this has been great conversation today. Um, I want to first just say uh, to my friend Aruna Miller, uh, we miss you on Ways and Means and all the, the great work that you've done with us. Uh, you've been, you were a great, extraordinary colleague for us here at Ways and Means and our committee dinners were amazing because of you <laughs> and very enjoyable. Uh, John, I, I bet you like the blueprint, man. I, I, <laughs> I thought the blueprint was your friend. You just went all over the place about the blueprint. Uh, let me ask a real question, because I think, John, you did bring up a, a very good question, though, which is how does this solve the problem of actually lowering class size? Like, what is what what do we intend to do? And I, I guess maybe the sponsor of the bill or MSEEA could speak to this about just give us what you're look, tell, give us a picture of what you're looking to accomplish as you're negotiating with um, the school systems? How would this work? Uh, Delegate Lewis, do you want to go or do you want me to answer some? I'll, I'll, I'll let the president go. Okay. So the part of even what uh, John talked about, I, I, I was taking note of his opinion about Blueprint. But anyway, um, Part of what even John talked about when we talk about class size uh, ratios, whether people have too large of class size, right now we can't even talk about those things. We can't even talk about uh, creative solutions. Um, and we have some schools that are under capacity as far as facilities, and maybe we could utilize classrooms and, and, and spread those out. How do we use our para educators uh, to deal with class size? Um, but right now, we can't even sit at the table. I don't have even all of the ideas. I know that the teachers that testify today have plenty of great ideas on how we can resolve this. We want the opportunity to talk about it. And as one person said, we're not talking about caps. We wanted, if we wanted to cross the board caps, that's what we would have, would have asked for. But we think that it can be creative and, and, and our educators' voices at the table can help us to do that. Um, I, I would contend that our elementary school students need smaller class size than maybe some of our middle schools and how we rate ratio out that staffing. Right now, many school systems just do a blanket ratio and they don't take into consideration the needs of the students, the needs of the community, um, the level of expertise of our educators. Over 50% of our, student, our educators leave within three years. So we are churning people in and out of our, our, our schools and that's not good for our students. So we want an opportunity to talk. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. That's my question. Thank you very much. Delegate Griffith. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and my question was, again, I find myself very much on the same page with Delegate Washington quite a bit. So I, <laughs> vice chair privilege. Uh, no, but uh, part of my question has to do with how would this work? Because, you know, it creates a, a leverage point to leverage other things. And short of caps, I'm not sure what can be done because again, some of my previous concerns with the blueprint was of course that uh, it didn't address, to Mr. Willen's point, it did not address um, uh, class size uh, where we could have done that in there. Uh, we're also passing some bills right now that uh, I'm afraid may make teachers' lives more difficult with disruptive students. Uh, which only compounds the problems that you're dealing with. And, and I just know for myself, like uh, with, with Mr. Carey uh, uh, and all the teachers that spoke, 
uh, I'd be, I would be beside myself if one of my kids was in a classroom with 38 kids, especially kids with uh, very needs that need more attention than, uh, you know, a neurotypical student. And, uh, and I, and I, so I totally commend these teachers for what they're doing and what they're having to go through. But to, to wrap up my question is short of caps. I don't know how this could be. I mean, obviously I think we're all, we all agree this is a problem needs to be solved and, I, I think every administrator in the state agrees with it. Every parent, every teacher agrees this is a real issue. But how would this be negotiated or leveraged without looking for some kind of caps, which then spreads out, pushing down, and then spreading out the problem? Uh, you know, I kind of think of like, you know, like, you know, mashed potatoes, you push it down and spreads out. Now the problems, you've, you've limited the class size, but now locations and teachers and resources, and then the spreading out also creates issues with, with school redistricting, and it kind of it, it plays out. So I just I agree with it, but what other what other how would this be done specifically without you know demanding caps? And I legitimately don't understand how that would work. Yeah, if if I may, Madam Chair. Um... Uh, first, I want to thank all the educators who are literally in classrooms across the state right now, uh, zooming in. Um, I, I think it's really powerful for us to lift up their voices. Uh, but, you know, Delegate, I think you partially answered your question. Like, they are prohibited from having that conversation to find creative ways to address this, right? Um, and, you know, the truth is a lot of our paraeducators are doing a lot of this work right now, you know, um, based on the conversations I've been having with President Bose and others, right? I think, I think those conversations for each jurisdiction could be different, um, and this just allows them the option to uh, to enter it into the conversation. Um, I also think we need to be honest with ourselves that like we are in a different world than we were pre-pandemic. You know, like it's I said my testimony about the Great Resignation intentionally because you know it's not unique to our teachers, um, but you know, we don't want to undermine the work we are doing with the blueprint, by not making sure they have working conditions that want them to stay, right? So it gives them an option and every jurisdiction can figure out what works for them. Madam Chair, can I add something just from looking across the country? Go ahead. So, you know, I think President Bose made an important point about the need for variation and what we see across the country in states where uh, class size can be bargained is that districts will make decisions to vary class size between elementary school versus high school, between types of classes. You might take a different approach in a science lab class than you take in a gym class or band class. Uh, districts will make decisions about where paras are assigned so that if early grades classes are too big, you might add a paraprofessional if that's the only solution available to you given your resource constraints. But I think the ability to negotiate the details and respond creatively um, makes this a, a bill important to pass. Um, Madam Chair, may I ask one brief follow-up? I'll get. Thank you. Uh, so, sir, you're just uh, you're just speaking to that. Could you give me an? Ex would you mind sharing an example of a state where this was passed and what they've seen the class sizes reduced to based upon this being able to be negotiated in other states? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge range across the country. We're only we're only one of nine states that doesn't allow this to be bargained. But you know, if you look back at one of the sort of premier studies on the impact of class size, the Tennessee Star study, it showed that when students were in much smaller classes in the early grades, like 15 in the early grades, kindergarten in particular, the long-term benefit could be seen four years or more later. Uh, but in, in different states, you see a range. You might have a band class where there are 30 students, but a science advanced placement lab class like AP chemistry where there are 20 students. I, I, I guess, uh, let me rephrase that question. I apologize for this. How, I guess the better way is how out of step is Maryland in class size versus states where this is allowed? Well, it's not so much that we're out of step on the average, it's that you have the situation like you heard about from uh, Mr. Carey, where you have 38 uh, 
there are many states where that would just be unheard of to have a have a class size of 38 and many districts where that would be unheard of because they have collectively bargained that that is not a flat football. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Welcome. Delegate Lukey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, You're a little low. Del you sound a little low. I will talk louder then. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, Ms. Bosa, let me just, let's walk through how this would work a, a second. So every, usually three years, your locals are bargaining with the um, school systems in question. All this does is allow for one of the discussions at the bargaining table to be around class sizes. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So it's not, it's not necessarily a mandate, right? And then, um, you know, at the bargaining table, um, there's a series of puts and takes. And I assume that making this a subject of bargaining, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily mean that it becomes the dominant issue at the bargaining table. All the other issues of the bargaining table are still on the table, right? Correct. So then um, in a situation where um, this became a subject of bargaining, the, the respective bargaining teams, the, the union locals and the, and the school systems, would have the ability, as I read it under this, to not only, I mean, they could set a, a cap, like an overall cap, but they would have the ability to bargain, for example, that a teacher could not have um, an inclusion classroom without, um, of, of a certain size, unless they had a paraeducator or something like that. Is that is that correct? That's correct. That could be one of the items. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question, because I, you know, I, I've been out of the classroom for a while now, um, but the last few years before I left the classroom, one of the things I experienced was significant increases in class sizes from an average of under 30 to an average of 36 or 37 in any given year, and including inclusion classes with special ed students, ESOL students, et cetera. And a lot of those cases, I didn't have paraeducator support. Um, it, in, in your judgment, is this a problem that's growing worse or are we holding steady or, you know, what, what are you hearing from your members? It's growing exponentially with the great resignation. So you have two parts to this. We have people leaving because of many working conditions, pay and other reasons. And so we don't have people to fill those vacancies. So those students are dispersed into other classrooms. And then you have the other part of this, I, I think of the field of dreams. If we build it the correct way, people will come and people will stay. So if we can build the class sizes and build the working conditions in the best manner to attract and retain educators, that'll happen. But it's growing exponentially with um, more students um, in, in inclusive, which is a good thing for our students, but then the paraeducators and the other staffing doesn't come along with it. Thank you very much. Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, also for Ms. Bose, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Among the things that uh, a collective bargaining agent bargains for people is uh, compensation and medical coverage, but you also bargain working conditions. You bargain hours that, that, that teachers work, days worked. And so this is a most rhetorical, but wouldn't you say that the size of a class is directly related to someone's working conditions? 100%, 100%. As Frank Soda said, the more papers you grade, the more parent contacts, the more everything is your working condition. And, and, and making good working conditions for teachers actually lets them focus on the job at hand, doesn't it? If you can improve their working conditions. Yes, my time at a, a fourth grade, as I said, in a Title I school is the best rewarding experience of my life. But I needed the time to be able to reach students. And we tried to work out ways to get additional staffing, additional parent helpers to pay so that I could have time to build relationships and address student needs. And those are some of the things that we could look at at the bargaining table. Are there certain schools because of student populations that maybe we need to add additional staffing to? Um, and so all of this could be creative in creating working conditions that people want to stay and people want to come into the profession. So it's not outrageous to have this on the table because it fits in with the other things that you do. Absolutely. And it would have to take mutual agreement between the district and the union as we come up with these discussions. Uh, it, will be, it will no longer be a, that we can't talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Lasanti. Thank you. And um, Delegate Ebersole basically was addressing my question, but it, because I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea that working conditions do not include the class size. I mean, that, that, that seems 
basically the one in the same. So I was wondering if anybody has any history that they can provide to me. So I have a better understanding why, why that, you know, I understand the calendar, not being able to negotiate the calendar, but why class size was, was pull, pulled out as, as, as an explicit prohibition in the contract negotiations? I wish I had that answer. Okay. I don't know the history of why that is. I'm not sure if at the time people were just looking at pure caps instead of the creativity that we can look at and how that tied into facilities. But I think we're much more uh, advanced in conversations and how we can address it. I think the blueprint will really help us to address this issue. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is for Mr. Willems. Mr. Willems, you know, I know that the uh, MABE is against the bill, um, but can you speak to MABES or any boards of education's direct plans to drive down class size right now? Is that is there a actual plan from the school systems to do this in conjunction with our teachers? Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, in, in one respect, um, Title I schools um, uh, generally have uh, smaller class sizes. The expansion of the community school program uh, should be anticipated to be implemented in a manner that would, uh, would ensure smaller class sizes consistent with those local Title I programs and Title I-like programs where a school might not meet the technical threshold to be a Title I school, but the local school system chooses to impose class size limitations uh, in, in that school. Uh, because of the relatively high percentage of economically disadvantaged students. Uh, but in terms of actual negotiations right now, uh, unfortunately, I would say because of the great resignation and the lack of available uh, sort of certificated teachers and paras uh, and, and, and staff uh, concerns, uh, or, I mean, space concerns, I don't know of any concerted efforts to, um, you know, sort of collaboratively address uh, the class size uh, issue. And I do think there is the prioritization of investing the blueprint money in what we're mandated to invest it in upfront and to take on some of those first challenges. And um, I, I, I will say I appreciate the local control aspect of this bill. I'm always in front of this committee advocating for local governance authority and control. And this bill is aligned with that in terms of making it a local negotiated issue. And would also say that as we negotiate career ladders uh, uh, starting kind of today and over the next couple of years, aligned with the blueprint, uh, we will be taking a, a refreshed look at collective bargaining uh, on the whole. So it is timely to take these issues into consideration. I really wanted to highlight uh, some of the uh, maybe unintended or um, unstated um, issues with, with the bill in, in ways that it might not solve the problem it, it appears to. Well, thanks for saying something positive, at least about the blueprint. I appreciate that. Um, and I would just add that, I don't know, last time you've been, I'm, and I'm not challenging you either, but I've been to Title I schools multiple times and class sizes are very uh, high. <laughs> I've not seen a Title I school where I've seen class sizes below 20 or below 15 or anything like that, where it's, a, where it's smaller average. I've not seen that. But I appreciate you answering the question directly, which is there's no effort on behalf of the school systems to really drive down class sizes. And I think that's a mistake on behalf of the on behalf of our students and teachers and parents um, that that's not happening at the leadership level of our state um, and our school system. So thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Wilkins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much to Delegate Lewis for bringing this bill. Um, I also have a question for Mr. Willems. I just, um, my understanding of the bill and from this conversation is that the bill just allows the, the conversation and both sides still have to agree in order for this to be bargained to be, have some resolution around class size. So I'm just trying to understand the opposition of MAVE. Is it your position that class size is does not impact education and educational outcomes and if that's not your position um why does Mabe want to not even have the conversation around class size delegate it's an it's an excellent question and in some respects i I, I might be as unclear or more unclear than many. Uh, 20 years ago, practically to the day, 
we uh, undertook a complete overhaul of negotiation in Maryland uh, and, and, and created this whole middle category of permissive subjects of bargaining. The subject used to be either mandated or illegal, uh, as kind of counterintuitive as that sounds. And so 20 years ago, uh, we, were, we introduced permissive categories. And for whatever reason at that time, uh, class size was not uh, taken up as, 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 a, as, a, as a new permissive subject. And ever since then, there have been any number of pretty significant reforms to collect a bargaining in the state, and class size has not been uh, among those. I believe it's because of A, some of the other states are, well, we can't guarantee you a smaller class size, but we'll give you a per pupil bonus for each uh, student in your classroom over the minimum. That's kind of this worst case scenario where you're really not solving the problem. Um, you're, you're just expending funds in a way that's neither helpful, I think, maybe to the teacher or students, um, but also because of those facility issues and staffing issues at the bargaining table with the limited state and local funds. What are you able to accomplish um, by, uh, by negotiating uh, class size? So, but I really don't have a good answer for why over the last 20 years, um, there hasn't been more of a concerted effort to, to address this uh, impermissible subject of bargaining. Madam Chair, if I can do a very quick follow-up. I, I just, Mr. Williams, I just do want to understand the position of, of MAVE as a result, as it relates to class size. Is it your position that class size does not impact educational outcomes? It, that is definitely not MAVE's position. And, um, MABE actually was uh, on record pretty consistently along with MSEA and, and BTU in supporting the APA study, which asked educators and administrators what they wanted the state to undertake in terms of education finance reform and smaller class sizes were uh, at the very top of that, uh, at, the, at the very top of that list. So we are very supportive of, uh, of initiatives to uh, promote staffing and adequate space to address class size and certainly recognize that it's an important quality of education issue. Okay, so it is important, but not for bargaining purposes. Noted. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Delegate Lukey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know uh, the chair is probably having flashbacks to judiciary with all these questions. Sorry about that. Um, Mr. Williams, I got up a second ago to, to grab my copy of the Maryland School Law Desk book, which has great authors, including John R. Williams on it. Um, and I was reading the, the section about um, subjects of bargaining. So to clarify for the committee, so I understand, under Maryland law, there's three types of subjects as pertains to collective bargaining, um, mandatory, permissible, and illegal subject of, of correct collective bargaining. Is that is that correct? So, sorry, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, so all this bill does is it moves class sizes from an illegal subject of bargaining to a permissible subject of bargaining, but it still would not be a mandatory subject of bargaining. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So in a case where um, a union local and, and a school system were at the negotiating table and the union local wanted to negotiate on class sizes and the um, and the school system was absolutely opposed to it, what, what would be the result? Would the school system be forced to negotiate about class sizes? No, and they shouldn't be in the posture of having to reply to a, to a, to a grievance or complaint that the denial that, of that request to bargain that topic is, uh, uh, is in bad faith. Uh, so they shouldn't be subject to an appeal to the Public School Labor Relations Board either. Okay. So I, I and I appreciate. I know uh, you know you, you're you're often in the position of being the only person in a in a hearing opposing it. I know that's that's tough sometimes, and it, it's not you know it's not personal for many of us. Um, but my final question. So um, in in your recollection, has Mabe ever supported a bill to expand the collective bargaining rights of its employees? of school system employees? So um, going back to 20 years ago, when we did the major overhaul of bargaining, we supported the expansion of bargaining rights to non-certificated employees on the Eastern shore. Okay. For, for, uh, and so they were trapped, if you will, in this meet and confer 
uh, mm. landscape, the nine Eastern Shore counties, did, uh, their non-certificated staff actually lacked formal bargaining rights. And we supported updating that to provide the Eastern Shore with the um, support staff with the same bargaining rights as the support staff on the Western Shore. But it would be fair to say this, this, your opposition here is not about class sizes, it's about bargaining and bargaining rights. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Delegate Lewis or any of the witnesses? Uh, I'll just make a comment. It's not really a question. Um, I too, like Delegate Lewis, want to thank the teachers uh, who took the time to came to testify today. Uh, it was incredibly enlightening and obviously it's an incredibly important topic uh, to you and it shows that you care about your students um, and your colleagues. So I, I want to say thank you uh, to that. Um, I also just want to suggest to the folks that testified and, and our committee you know, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. So this might be kind of a question. Um, and I am the new person on the committee, even though I'm chair. Um, so enrollments have been down since the pandemic. And so those folks who, who can afford to, to put their kids in private school have done so. And I think those parents don't necessarily want to stay in private school, but be, they have chosen to because of the, they've seen that they've seen the difference, right? They've seen the difference and the attention that their kids can get when they're in a classroom of 16 kids, as opposed to going back to a class size of 30 some some odd kids. So those are decisions I think that parents are making um, right now. And I think that this is definitely an issue. Um, not not being able to discuss the issue. Um, is doing a disservice to, to our teachers and also to the students because, you know, you've got students who, who are quite frankly missing out on learning if teachers, if all they're doing is, is managing the classroom. I mean, the gentleman that talked about uh, his science class, good Lord, I, I can't manage my three kids barely, let alone 30 kids in a friggin' science class. I mean, so I think um, this is something that this committee needs to take a serious look at. Um, and Delegate Lewis, I appreciate uh, uh, the legislation. So thank you. And that was not a question. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 890. So thank you, everybody. Next, Delegate Wilkins, House Bill 850. We'll see if there are that many questions for you. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much, <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> Greetings to everyone on the committee, uh, Mr. Vice Chair as well. I am Janelle Wilkins for the record, and I'm pleased to prevent, present House Bill 850. And sorry, one second, my notes here. Okay. House Bill 850 prohibits discrimination in schools for pre-K through K-12 students enrolled in schools that received state public funding. And I'm proud that this committee and the House has passed this bill for the last three years in a row. I am confident that we'll be able to work with our Senate partners for full passage this year. As you know, Maryland currently has a patchwork of anti-discrimination provisions. And for some types of schools, there is no codified anti-discrimination language at all. This bill creates clear anti-discrimination protections for all of our students. Specifically, HB 850 prohibits a local board of education, um, a public pre-K program in primary secondary schools, non-public pre-K programs and secondary schools that receive state funding from refusing enrollment of a prospective student, expelling a current student or withholding privileges or otherwise discriminating against an individual due to race, color, religion, sex, age, national origin, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. It also requires the types of schools that I just mentioned to also print a specified anti-discrimination statement in their handbooks and the language that already exists in federal and state law. It also prohibits refusing enrollment or retaliation for a student or parent that files a discrimination complaint. And it creates a dispute resolution process for when there is a complaint that arises. This bill creates a proactive, stated, and clear non-discrimination policy in all of our schools in Maryland that receive state funds. And this is a critical bill. 
every single student should be protected from discrimination in Maryland law. I do have one amendment to the bill that clarifies that schools must adhere to the Federal Rehabilitation Act of 1973 uh, or the Federal uh, Americans with Disabilities Act as applicable. Again, we have passed this bill through committee three different times and I urge a favorable report on HB 850. Thank you. Next, the remaining witnesses will have two minutes each. Justin Nally, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Justin Nally, policy analyst at the ACLU of Maryland. The ACLU of Maryland here is support of House Bill 850. We thank the committee for the support of this bill the past few years. Uh, the bill passed the House last year, and we believe that it's important that this is the year that it finally becomes law. Unlike other parts of Maryland law, such as public accommodations, employment, and fair housing, Maryland's education laws do not have codified anti-discrimination protections. MSDE does have stated guidance, but this guidance does not provide those legal protections of a codified policy. This legislation simply codifies that guidance. Students who experience discrimination in private schools that receive public funding do not currently have a clear process which they can file a complaint or seek remedy for being victimized. This bill creates clear right of action and a process. The bill also mirrors the anti-discrimination language found in the budget and also includes students with disabilities, gender identity, and gender expression. By requiring students, uh, excuse me, by requiring schools that have clear policies on discrimination, as they do for student codes of conduct, students and families will know how to file a complaint and resolve the discrimination. We, we, we can't hear you. Justin, you cut out. We can't hear you for some reason. You're not on mute. Couldn't, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, next, Leslie Margolis for two minutes, please. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Leslie Side Margolis. I'm a managing attorney at Disability Rights Maryland, um, the um, protection and advocacy agency for the, for the state. I'm also the chair of the Education Advocacy Coalition, um, a group made up of close to 40 organizations and individuals concerned with education policy affecting students with disabilities throughout the state. As we have done before, we are here to support House Bill 850, um, we're so pleased that children with disabilities are included. Um, you know, if a school is getting state money, um, it should not be able to use that money to discriminate against children with disabilities, period. Um, we believe that these amendments that make clear that the reference to federal law means Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act should answer the questions that have come up in the past from schools that think that um, somehow they have to replicate the, um, the federal special education law or serve all kids with all kinds of disabilities. This really simply is requiring reasonable accommodations. Um, and, and we hope that this will be, that third time will be the charm and that this year will, will pass. So thank you for your previous support. And really I'm here to answer any questions that you may have about the, about the law relating to students with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Next for two minutes, Michelle Schlofer, please. Hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Michelle Schleoffer. I'm a Wicomico County resident of thir District 38B. I'm also a parent of two children in Wicomico County Public Schools, and I'm a community psychologist, and I'm here to uh, speak with you for a couple minutes about why passing the Inclusive Schools Act is important for me. Um, I wanna start by just sharing that when I enrolled my oldest child in school here um, a decade ago, I, I approached the principal of his school and I asked two very simple questions. I asked, what training has your school staff had to work with LGBTQ youth? And what policies does the district have in place to specific to supporting LGBTQ youth? And the answer that I received to those two questions was none and none. Um, I offered to provide resources and access to training to meet the needs of LGBTQ youth here in our county schools. And I offered to provide such training for free. I was refused and I was actually told that if I wanted such types of services and protections for children in, this, in, in schools, that I would have to move to a metropolitan area 
and I was uh, specifically told to move to DC. And I left that meeting feeling really demoralized and berated. Um, since that time, you know, I went home, I looked on the Wicomico County Public Schools website for policies or even any mention that LGBTQ youth um, exist in our county. And the principal was right. There is no policies, there was no guidelines, and the website um, does not even mention to this day LGBTQ youth anywhere. Um, it's like LGBTQ youth just don't exist. So based on this, I formed in 2015, um, Salisbury's PFLAG chapter to help push for greater visibility and support of LGBTQ people here in our community. And I've met um, in the past seven years a steady stream of parents and youth in our local school system who relate to me and others in our uh, community, very severe injustices occurring in our county public schools. And there's a long list, but I will share a few of them. I've heard instances of verbal harassment, including harassment of youth by school staff. I've heard of administrative and public opposition to the formation of student clubs to support LGBTQ youth. And I've met students who have refused to walk in their own graduation ceremony because the gendered graduation gowns were not in alignment with their gender identity and the school district was not willing to make changes. So I, I'm here today you know, to ask, we're here a decade out after I've asked my simple question to the school principal and our county still has no policies or protections for LGBTQ youth. And I really would like to ask that we get a favorable report and hopefully pass this act so that uh, children here in our county have the same types of protections that other LGBTQ youth in other areas of our state have. Um, thank you so much for hearing my testimony and for having me here today. Carol Boast, please, for two minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair Atterbury and members of the committee and sponsor Delegate Wilkins. I'm Cheryl Boast, a fourth and fifth grade teacher from Baltimore County, still serving as the president of the Maryland State Education Association with over 75,000 educators across the state. We are in strong support of House Bill 850 and hope that this year is the year that we can get it across the finish line. This bill is simply about providing every child with a safe and inclusive school environment one that respects who they are, however they show up in the world today. It is also about ensuring that each and every child that attends a school funded in whole or in part by public dollars is provided equal protection under both federal and state law. I want you to ask yourself, do you believe everyone has the right to not be discriminated against based on race, ethnicity, color, religion, sex, age, national origin, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability? If you answered yes, then you must support this bill because that's what this bill is about. It's about students whose parents might be LGBTQ. It's about protecting students with disabilities, students of different ethnicities, races, and religion. It's about making sure that any state-funded institution is safe for all. Some have argued that an effort such as this seeks to unfairly and unconstitutionally deny religious schools their First Amendment right to freely exercise their religion. This is not the case. The acceptance of public funding by a non-public school is not mandatory, it's voluntary. If the non-public school does not wish to abide by the law, then they cannot engage in discriminatory practices or choose not to accept the funding. The requirement of this bill, it, bill is not new to any recipient of public, public funds. Public schools are and have long been aware of this requirement to adhere here to federal and state laws, in this case, as it specifically relates to prohibitions against discriminatory practices. At the end of the day, this legislation is really just about ensuring that no student in a public funded school is discriminated against. We are to favorable report on House Bill 8, 850. Thank you. Paul Hollywood, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, committee, and thank you for your time. My name is Nicole Hollywood. I'm a resident of Maryland's Eastern Shore, residing in District 37. I'm a professor, president of the Board of Salisbury PFLAG, and a parent to multiple LGBTQ children. While some counties have taken proactive measures, there remain no statewide anti-discrimination protections for LGBTQ learners. These insufficient protections for and inequities in the treatment of LGBTQIA learners enrolled in Maryland schools contributes to a climate uh, that is unsupportive and even often hostile. Because of the lack of protections, LGBTQIA youth continue to face bullying, exclusion, and discrimination in school, putting them at physical and psychological risk and limiting their educational potential. 
Research conducted on LGBTQIA youth in schools has found that unsupportive educational climates contribute to lower academic performance, lower GPA, increased absences, increased likelihood of school dropout, psychological distress, and a decreased likelihood of attending an institutional higher ed. According to the most recent Gleason School Climate Survey, 98% of LGBTQ students have heard the term gay used in a negative way or other homophobic remarks. More than one half of students have heard homophobic remarks from teachers or school staff. 86% of students have experienced harassment or assault based on their actual or perceived gender expression, sexual orientation, religion, race, or ethnicity. And 59% of LGBTQ students feel unsafe at school. As a parent of children with Comico County schools, where absolutely no protections exist, and there is no acknowledgement that LGBTQ students exist, I can affirm the hostile environment and the bombardment of homophobic remarks kids face on a regular basis. Further, teachers and administrators are often the worst perpetrators. In fact, I was once called to my middle son's middle school when he was in eighth grade and cornered by three teachers who felt compelled to out my wonderful high-performing child and request that I gender police his behavior because they considered an openly gay student to be a distraction to the learning environment and they could not guarantee his safety. These educators did not know me. They were not aware of whether I was a supportive parent or whether their actions could put my son in danger. One of the teachers repeatedly told me he's a Christian and a Sunday school teacher, which I can only perceive as a formal declaration of his hostile hostility towards my child. He further added that he had initiated speaking to my son's classmates about my son and the discussion revolved around their discomfort regarding his sexual orientation. This is unconscionable. I left that encounter and after crying in my car in the school parking lot for a half hour, I realized I needed to do everything in my power to initiate change. I now sit in front of you as- I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up your testimony, I'm sorry. I now sit in front of you as a parent and activist acting for a favorable report out of committee. Well, I asked you too soon, thank you. (laughs) Shamoya Gardner, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. My name is Shamoya Gardiner, and I am Executive Director of Strong Schools Maryland, here in support of House Bill 850. Thank you to everyone on this committee who has supported efforts in the past to get non-discrimination legislation passed, especially for our earliest learners and their families. And of course, thank you to Delegate Wilkins for continuing to champion this issue. The entire point of Maryland investing so heavily in the expansion of pre-kindergarten for three and four-year-olds, as well as the growth of Judy and Patty centers required under the blueprint for Maryland's future, is to provide high quality early learning opportunities for students that will launch them onto successful journeys to on-time graduation, college, career, choice in their lives. For families, this wide array of intergenerational offerings and the individual relationships that stand to be built with providers, educators, and other families can create the ecosystem to support strong starts for all of our children. However, if this legislature again fails to pass House Bill 850, and I am talking about the entire legislature, discrimination against students and families from non-public and other education actors will continue unchecked and be allowed to undermine the creation of the world-class system public schools that you all have just spent several years fighting for. The Migration Policy Institute found that discrimination hinders students' behavior and academic performance while stymieing them as they develop a sense of self if they're experiencing that at the earliest years. The same report found that discrimination deters familial engagement with the education provider, which of course makes sense. We shouldn't need research to tell us this, but here we are. We must not miss this moment to pass House Bill 850 now. This legislature has the choice to provide recourse for students and families who will and do now experience discrimination on the basis of their identities. The General Assembly can bolster the implementation of the blueprint by passing the bill with haste. And for those reasons, we urge this committee to continue its history of good decision making and issue a favorable report on House Bill 850. Thank you. Wow, that was exactly two minutes. Thank you. Charlie Wetterin, please, for two minutes. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Charlie Wetterin, and I am non-binary and bisexual. I am a recent graduate at Richard Montgomery High School, and I am currently attending my first year of college in California. While at Richard Montgomery, I attended both my school's Gender and Sexuality Alliance and a countywide LGBT student organization called MoCo Pride. Across these two groups, there was only one thing in common. These organizations were formed by LGBT students for LGBT students to support each other because we did not receive support from our schools or the adults. 
High school is often referred to as the carefree days of our lives, free from adult responsibilities. And for the most part, this is true. Students generally do not have to worry about rent, bills, and the challenges of our world. But high school can be terrifying and filled with worry for completely different reasons. Many students of Moco Pride have reported verbal attacks, sexual harassment, and threats of physical assault. I myself have heard slurs thrown across the hallway with no repercussions. Students don't have the confidence to report these incidents to staff because it doesn't seem like our facility is equipped to support us, and sometimes they even join in on the abuse. They misgender us and dead name us, and they make excuses for other students when these incidents are reported. And they appear either ignorant or inconsiderate of our, as, of our vulnerability as LGBT students. Our education and our high school experience worsens as a result. It's really difficult to concentrate on your learning when you're afraid of your classmates and you don't think your teacher will help you. This fear transforms school from a place of learning and excitement for the future to a place of trauma. We are still the students of your school. We want to spend our time worrying about homework and, and tests and if our crush will go to prom with us. We don't, have, we don't want to worry that if we do bring our crush to prom, we'll be banned from participating. We need to know that there are policies protecting us and that there's recourse we can take to regain the feeling of safety and belonging that is ripped away when we are isolated this way. We are citizens and Marylanders and should be afforded basic protections, including access to safe and quality education. In order for policies to be effective and enforceable, they need to be written down and made available to all students and their families. Without our school's commitment in writing to not tolerate any discrimination in their schools, students will have little to no assurance of their safety and protections. We are doing our best to make schools safer from the ground as students, like our creation of safe spaces for LGBT students. But you have the power to make real change across the state and for students who, by no fault of their own, are in schools that don't have similar support groups. I ask you I'm to honor to ask. the trust. Thank you. Go ahead. I ask you to honor the trust placed in you as our parents and leaders and protect all the students of your state. Please vote in favor of House Bill 850. Ash McGovern, please, for two minutes. Hi, thank you uh, all esteemed committee members for allowing me to testify today in favor of House Bill 850. Um, my name is Ash McGovern, I use they and them pronouns, and I'm the Director of Policy for Family Equity and Justice and Senior Policy Council for Family Equality, which is the largest organization in the nation specifically focused on LGBTQ plus families. We are particularly excited to support this bill today because the policy would prohibit a school from discriminating against a student on the basis of their or their caregiver's sexual orientation and gender identity among other key characteristics. We're also encouraged by the fact that this legislation establishes a complaint and remedy process that allows parents to file complaints. The majority of students that we work with and talk to report harassment to their families, not to school administrators, and that this would make policies public and available to all families. And those are both essential elements in our minds. From our own first of our kind research, we know that um, for many students with LGBTQ parents and families, School is not a safe environment because they experience discrimination from school personnel, peers, and also parents of other students. More than a quarter of students said that they could not fully participate in school because they had an LGBT parent, and 36% felt that the school personnel did not acknowledge that they were even from an LGBTQ family. About a fifth of students report that they'd been discouraged from talking about their parents or family at school, and about 20% said they felt excluded from classroom activities. One in four felt unsafe in school because of harassment that they experienced based on their LGBTQ families. Students whose schools had a comprehensive and safe school policy like the one that's being proposed reported fewer negative experiences in schools, particularly in being mistreated by teachers, other families, and other students because of their family composition. Again, I wanna emphasize most students did not tell school authorities when they experienced harassment and discrimination at school. Most told their families, so it's really important that this policy is distributed to families at school, um, including families, uh, LGBTQ families of students. We need all members of the school community, parents, educators, and students to know very clearly and explicitly that LGBTQ students and their families are protected from discrimination and that they have remedies if they experience that discrimination. Thank you so much for your time. Armila Master for two minutes, please. <clears throat> 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Lamaster. My pronouns are he and they, and I serve as the executive director of Free State Justice, a 30-year-old legal services and policy advocacy organization supporting lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer Marylanders. Uh, today, I'm here in support of HB 850. Um, I grew up as a low-income student of a single-parent family. I received financial aid to attend a private Catholic school. Uh, like a bill we just heard earlier, I received hot meals um, from public funding. I received Pell Grants from public funding. I would not be the person I am today without this financial support. However, if as a child I had a choice, I would have chose to attend a school that had policies and protections for queer kids. As a queer student, I did not have a safe learning environment. I learned in constant fear and I lost years of my life digging out of the trauma I experienced. My school did not have a policy like HB 850. In best case scenarios, students like me exist in a don't ask, don't tell environment. We no longer require this of our military, so why are we asking this of our children? HB 850 would allow Maryland to join 18 other states that have adopted non-discrimination policies for their schools. It would implement a published policy that research shows is the single biggest improvement in school environments by reducing absenteeism, reducing bullying, enhancing grades, and contributing to overall improved safety and well-being. It would implement a policy that has been shown to improve learning outcomes for black and brown students, for immigrant students, for disabled students, for LGBTQ students, for girls, and for low-income students. Kids like me had no choice in where we are born, uh, how much money our family makes, and um, much less uh, choice in where we go to school. Uh, so it's our duty as adults to protect all kids wherever they are. Um, I'm not here today to shut down schools. Um, I'm not here to mandate speech. I'm here to simply ask that the absolute bare minimum um, be done, that public funds, taxpayer money, um, are used to create learning environments free of discrimination, and that students and their families know that they can expect their schools to be free of discrimination. I urge a favorable report on HB 850. Thank you. There is one individual signed up to test unfavorable, Vince McAvoy, for two minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me all right then? Yes. Very good, thank you. Um, Promotion of sexuality is not what real parents believe in or send their kids to school for. This is not discrimination. What this bill is doing is looking for license to promote LGBT as a primary educational focus. That's not what school's about. You all just heard that Judy and Montessori schools are those which are promoting LGBT. This is among preschools. These kids are three and four years old. What business does the state have pushing or insisting upon sexuality amongst three and four year olds, it's perversion, mental illness, an agenda, okay? And this, it's not about learning, it's about sexual identity. It's an agenda about that. If children are stuck with, with parents like that, they can go to public school, um, but why try to wreck traditional or religious schools? It's reprehensible that teachers unions and ACL push this garbage. This is not about discrimination. This bill is because it's not those other groups. You heard who's speaking about this bill. It's exactly what I said. It's shoving this harmful ideology and the beliefs that are diametrically opposed to these poor little kids. Alliance Defense resolved this case. They beat ACLU, they beat the others that came. If this case has gone to favor LGBT, you'd say the case is closed. This case is closed. Your attack on these toddlers and children ended when Bethel won that case. The federal court here right in liberal Baltimore sided with the school in question Okay, it was since I had to change their website because of all the nonsense. This bill is written, to, it's written, look at page eight. It's written to stifle schools whose first goal is education, not litigation. These kids have their own beliefs. Let's respect these children's beliefs. If you don't want to go to that school, don't go. They tell you right up front what they're about. So there's no miscommunication. They have as much a right to what they do and what they, how they run their things as anyone else does. For these other ones that are actually judy and montessori is trying to get funding this year i think half a million that shouldn't thank you. be thank you all right thank you for your time committee questions okay thank you delegate wilkins and that concludes the testimony on house bill 850. house bill 633 Delegate Greist, and there are three uh, individuals signed up to testify after you for, that will have two minutes each. All right, oh, sorry. 
Go ahead, whenever you're ready. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, uh, Delegate Grice uh, presenting House Bill 633. And uh, for those of you who are on the Education Subcommittee, you probably uh, re remember uh, Michelle Lambert. She's the uh, lead counsel uh, for the Appropriations Committee and also the Education Subcommittee. And uh, you probably remember because she served on a lot of um, our work groups, um, you know, while we were working through um, House Bill 1300, and uh, she drafted um, this bill, House Bill 633, hey, and she asked, sure are we just eating out tonight? Yeah, and she asked the question, you know, do you want to make a statement or do you want this bill to pass? Um, and this bill is so important um, in, in various parts of the state. Um, that we want this bill to get passed. Um, you know, this isn't a statement bill, um, and I'm hoping that, um, you know, that you all will take this into very serious consideration, and it will impact some of um, some of your, your districts. Um, and so when we passed House Bill 1300, um, <clears throat> you know, we understood how important accountability would be if we were going to mandate broad sweeping uh, accountability, um, or broad sweeping changes, I'm sorry, and how we educate our children in Maryland's public schools. And we also understood the importance of having diversity uh, in the accountability and implementation board. Um, sadly, last fall, um, the nominating committee failed to send uh, to the governor a list of names that represent both uh, geographic and racial diversity, uh, despite House Bill 1300 um, expressly requiring them to do so. So this past September, Governor Hogan requested the nominating committee sent him a more diverse pool of nominees from which to choose. And unfortunately, um, they did not. And therefore, we asked this committee to expand the membership from uh, seven to 11 members and require that we have uh, membership from all regions of the state. And I will say a wise man um, who, uh, on, under normal circumstances, when we're not Zooming, uh, sits very close to you guys, um, said uh, this past fall. We're disappointed uh, with the list of nominees that were released today by the Accountability and Implementation Board Nominating Committee. Uh, none of the applicants who were selected are residents of Prince George's County, our state's second largest school district, and home to over 130,000 students in need of resources and direct services provided by the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Um, now, this bill would guarantee the five largest counties including Prince George's, have representation on the IAB board. And as you all are aware, um, there also is no representation from Western Maryland, uh, Southern Maryland, or the Eastern Shore. And this bill guarantees that those region, regions uh, would also be represented. Uh, the local bo governing bodies and school boards in these regions understand the importance of representation. Um, uh, there are stark differences in every corner of Maryland and the power that's in the hands of this board should not be limited to just uh, four count, just four out of the 24 jurisdictions that we have in Maryland. IAB is responsible for developing a statewide comprehensive plan to guide reforms and approve county level implementation plans. It also has the power to withhold 25% of new state funding from, count, from counties each fiscal year until the board approves a county's progress toward implementing reform. So this is a big deal. So we ask uh, that please move this bill with a favorable report in order to give Marylanders from all parts of the state a voice in the future of Maryland's public education. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, Laura Price for two minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Laura Price and I am president of the Maryland Association of Counties and Councilwoman for Talbot County requesting a favorable report on HB 633. MAKO has been an integral part of the history of the blueprint and has been there through the entire process. While MAKO may not have an actual seat on this board, we are confident that with greater representation on the AIB, that collaboration can continue. This is important because there is a huge difference in needs between the larger urban areas and the smaller rural ones. The Kerwin Commission met and deliberated for three years to develop the broad policy areas of the blueprint. And one of those policy areas was this oversight board during the, and during the actual deliberations at the time, there was discussion for the AIB to be a larger body. For whatever reason, the state landed on the current composition. After the final recommendations, that process was followed by nearly a year of work on how to pay for it and determine the appropriate split between the state and the counties before ultimately passing the blueprint. 
Now that each county is beginning the blueprint implementation, we're realizing at the state and local level that the original size and structure of the AIB was probably too small to adequ adequately represent each county. So with all of that effort and commitment of funding and resources, it is critical that we have proper oversight. This board is the instrument to ensure that that happens. Members of this committee, it is important that this body consider expanding that membership now while we're still at the early stages of implementation so that we can ensure that everyone has adequate representation. For those reasons, MAKO is asking that you find HB 633 favorable. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. On January, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, esteemed committee members. It's so good to be before this body again today. Uh, for the record, Brianna January here representing the Maryland Association of Counties, also known as MAKO, in enthusiastic support of HB 633. Uh, as always, you have my written testimony and MAKO President Price has hit on uh, many of our talking points already, so I'll be brief. Counties commend the bill sponsor. Uh, for, for this measure to expand the Blueprint Accountability and Implementa Implementation Board um, and to be more representative of the state's diverse regions and their unique needs. As the committee has heard, uh, the AIB will play a crit critical role as a local partner for school systems as they begin their work implementing the many complex reforms as required by the Blueprint. The needs and realities of school systems vary greatly and each will experience different challenges and opportunities in implementing the blueprint and working with the AIB. And these jurisdictions should have their perspectives and needs properly and fairly represented on the board in order to successfully implement the blueprint. Uh, committee, Maryland's students deserve the best shot at successful implementation and educational reform. Passing HB 633 will help the state and the locals as they partner to do so. And for these reasons, MAKO supports the bill and urges a favorable report. Thank you. Lee Lager was signed up, but I don't think she is with us. So with that, are there any questions? Uh, Delegate Rose. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Delegate Rice, for this bill. Um, and with the timing of getting some testimony to you and working with it within our county commissioner's um, meeting schedule, um, were you aware that our county took a formal position supporting this bill um, so that Carroll County, Western Maryland, you know, this will definitely directly affect us? Are you aware that that our we, not only individuals were supporting it, but also our county commissioner board? Yeah, we yeah we have, and you'll you'll see um, in um, in your testimony, uh, we do have support not only from the local governing bodies but school boards throughout the, the entire state. Um, so there, this, this is a very well supported bill. Great, and then just as a follow up, in addition, um, were you aware? I think we tried to let your office know. Um, I had personal conversations with the majority of our local school board, and they are all very very um, interested and feel that this is extremely important for uh, getting that Western Maryland uh, input so that the majority of our school board is also in support. Were you aware of that? And I just wanted the committee to know. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 633. Thank you, Delegate Greist. Next, calling House Bill 805 and colleagues joining us. Um, our individuals from the Appropriations Committee, Delegate Forbes, Smith, and Grice to stay here with us for this bill. <laughs> um, so Delegate Schlega and then uh, the individuals signed up after you will have two minutes each. So whenever you're ready, Delegate. Great, thanks so much, Chair Atterbury and members of Ways and Means and the appropriation members joining us. For the record, I'm Delegate Kathy Schlega. Today before you, I have House Bill 805. It's primary and secondary education, virtual schools alterations. I know that you've seen a number of bills about virtual schooling. This bill was in last year, so you heard it last year, but I know there's a number of measures that you guys are concerning or considering. So, you know, during the COVID pandemic, obviously schools quickly went to virtual learning. Um, this did work for some kids and it didn't work for, for others. Um, but you have to ask yourself with every bill, what problems are we trying to solve? 
So when students return to the uh, traditional model of post-pandemic back in the classroom, and, and now thank, thankfully most of them are back without a mask, there was no option for them to continue in virtual learning. And some students, as you know, have really thrived in this platform. Um, so we know virtual learning is here to stay. Um, 33 other states are already offering a fully virtual online public school option for kids. Um, online learning will continue to improve and create new opportunities for students and as you know, the online schooling that's built to be online is not a Zoom call that kids tune into like they did, you know, for the last, uh, what, year and a half, almost two years in many cases. So these are schools built to be delivered online. And this bill, House Bill 805, is simply an authorizing bill. It is not a mandate. I would tell you that there's some testimony against the bill from the Anne Arundel County Public Schools saying it is a mandate. It is not a mandate, it's simply authorizing. But we do need to make some changes to the laws to allow authorizing of these online schools. Um, and that would be uh, the on page three of the bill where we're asking for the length of time, the attendance, the curriculum, the class size, some of these things have to be modified just for the format and structure of online learning. Similar to home and hospital care, which these will be students that could really get great quality education from a virtual, full-time virtual online opportunity. Um, and the, the vision for this, uh, and as you all in this committee put these bills together and hopefully pass an online, a virtual online schooling opportunity bill, which you know, I, I'd hope you'd take a look at ours because it has some really, really good features in it, would be to allow all counties and Baltimore City to put an RFP out. So they don't need to create the wheel. They don't need to in, you know, invest millions of dollars to create an online school. There are at least three national companies that are currently doing this. One happens to be headquartered right here in Maryland, Pearson, whom you're going to hear from after me, they are headquartered here and they deliver public school virtual learning across our country. So, you know, the vision here, the counties, the city, and I also included a higher ed. I, Towson University said they would be interested in an opportunity to start a virtual school as well. But it, th these institutions could put an RFP out let these online school uh, virtual schooling vendors come back with a price that would certainly be less than the per pupil allocation that all of our school systems are getting. And any additional money, let's say, you know, most of our school systems are getting about 18,000 per pupil per year. Let's say uh, that it comes back at 12 or 13, that additional money the school system could then use to fund special ed and some of our other programs that really need extra money. So um, this again, it's simply enabling. It is a public school option. The RFP could, could and should say certified Maryland teachers, free, you know, all of the options that we wanna make sure that our public schools offer today. Um, and, it is not a traditional classroom setting, so we took out the language in the current code that says the same of length of time for learning opportunities because obviously a virtual setting is going to be different, you know, when the kids come to school and, you know, they, they get recess, they get lunch, they get, you know, other opportunities where they're not in the classroom. They, they could be engaged in other things, but just not online. So, um, what I'd really like to do is turn it over to Mickey Ravenel after me. She is from Pearson. They operate schools right here in Maryland. They have a state-of-the-art, amazing school in Prince George's County that they've been running for many, many years. And uh, Mickey's really the expert. I think she can tell you about that and answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mickey Ravenel, for two minutes, please. 
Thank you so much, Madam Chair, member of the Ways and Means Committee. I appear before you today as actually a, one of the co-founders of Connections Academy, um, which you just heard a little bit about. We're a leading provider of high quality online learning that actually launched back in 2001 right here in Maryland. As Pearson Virtual Schools now, we serve 110,000 students across more than 30 states and around the world. Two decades of experience tell me the time is now and the need is urgent to make the same high quality option available to children in Maryland. This is why we highly support HB 805. State after state has provided families with the choice of a thoughtfully designed online school that's flexible, safe, and effective. Research shows no statistical difference in state math and reading scores between brick and mortar schools and our Connections Academy virtual schools. While parent satisfaction at Connections tops 90% year after year. And when COVID hit, Connections Academy students kept right on learning, no learning loss on our watch. When parents saw the structure and support available at purpose-built online schools like Connections, tens of thousands made the switch, but not in Maryland. In Maryland, zip code roulette still rules. Some districts offer quality online learning options and others do not. Families who can afford it choose our private virtual school, but there is no online public school accessible to every student in Maryland. You can change that now. HB 805 provides a common sense way for Maryland to join the two thirds of American states that already offer online public school options accessible to all. And it reflects the persistent call we hear from, Mar uh, from families across Maryland for schooling that lets their children learn how they learn best. Please answer that call by moving HB 805 forward with a favorable committee report. I'm here to answer any questions you might have and thank you so much for your time. Sparks for two minutes, please. Hi, my name is Amy Sparks. I'm a resident of Rosedale, Maryland. I'm here to support House Bill 805. Um, I just testified on another important virtual school bill. So if it's okay, I'd like to just carry over my testimony for this bill, but you have my full written testimony. Um, I think it's important to say that in the last 15 years, I have never felt like just a number with my family's school Pearson Online. My son is exceeding with his virtual school foundation and is currently taking cybersecurity in CCBC and will no doubt be protecting your bank accounts from hackers in a few years. Which brings me to my baby girl. She's now in the 10th grade. She's been completely home uh, virtual schooled. While I've witnessed many schools thrown into what I would call crisis online learning mode, I am relieved to say that my daughter's quality education has not missed a beat. She could do her classwork any time of day or night. I share my story with you because through these 15 years, I have repeatedly been contacted by parents to find out how they can get my virtual school option. Unfortunately, it's not available as a public school in this state. While it is available in now 33 states, I think Virginia just added two more virtual options. Um, a state school would give the families whose counties do not have the enrollment numbers for access to a full quality virtual program. I think if you look in the news, I think Cal County was just there in July. Parents got told we're not offering a virtual school option. That's unfair, especially with COVID-19. They just said in July, no virtual school option because of low enrollment. And that's not fair to these fa families. These families need more options. It's your job to look ahead to prepare Maryland. Do families need to wait another 18 years? Vote to approve House Bill 805. Do not let this bill die in the committee. Maryland families deserve to have House Bill 805 brought to the House floor for a vote. Because I'm gonna say this really quick, but I don't know if you understand, they're ping-ponging us back and forth with our phone calls. So if you're not in our district and we call you, they can't get, they tell us, oh, talk to your delegate. Our delegate says, oh, wait, when it gets to the house floor, give us a phone call, call us back. So you're not even getting our messages. And when we call you because you're on the subcommittee, we can't even get in touch with you guys because you guys say, oh, wait a minute, we're not in your district. Thank you. Lisa Cloakhagen for two minutes, please. Hi, thank you for hearing me today. I have an 11 year old who struggled in public school. Bullied to the point 
she skipped more days in fourth grade than she attended. She, she hated school. Her grades suffered. We found Pearson. Not only does she love school, has she gotten involved in politics? And yes, you will have her letter next week. Um, she skipped a grade in math last year. An entire grade. Her highest grade right now this semester and last semester is in seventh grade math. Seventh grade math at 11 years old. You're doing algebra. You're tutoring other kids so you can pay for your tuition because you know that your parents can't and this state doesn't support you. What more does a child have to do to get her state support so that she can attend a school where she feels safe? Go to the police department, look up her name, look up the report that was filed and tell me you're not disgusted. Take five minutes and go look it up. It's disgusting. That's all. Thank you. Please consider this bill. Any questions for Delegate Schlega or anyone who testified? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 805. Calling our final bill of the day, House Bill 832, Delegate Ruth. And then there are about 36-ish people signed up after Delegate Ruth who will have two minutes, two minutes each to testify. So Delegate Ruth, whenever you are ready. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Delegate Sheila Ruth presenting House Bill 832. House Bill 832 creates a homeschool advisory council in the Maryland State Department of Education. MSDE has other advisory councils such as the Maryland Early Childhood Advisory Council and the Maryland State Advisory Council on Gifted and Talented Education. The purpose of the Homeschool Advisory Council is to act as a liaison between MSDE and the homeschool community and to advise the state superintendent and the State Board of Education on matters related to homeschooling. Homeschooling in Maryland is regulated by MSDE in Comar, and Maryland's homeschool regulations provide a good balance of enough regulation to ensure that children are learning without being overburdensome or intrusive for homeschool families. Homeschooling families are incredibly diverse in homeschooling goals, philosophy, reasons for homeschooling and methods, but all of them value the flexibility and independence of homeschooling. I loved my time homeschooling my son. I love that it gave me the flexibility to customize the program to his needs and his ways of learning, whether it was reading books, doing science experiments, or hiking in Patapsco State Park. My son is now 26 years old, newly married, and he and his wife are both finishing up PhDs in physics. I treasured the times we spent together homeschooling, and we remain close, even though he and his wife live in another state. Homeschoolers generally oppose any additional regulation, but this bill does not impose any regulation or oversight. The council created in this bill would simply be a conduit for communication. I know this committee is aware of the intense public interest that this bill has generated. I have been meeting with members of the homeschool community, including parents and homeschool groups and stakeholders such as the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. I've been actively listening to concerns and I've developed a series of amendments that I believe will address many of these concerns. The amendments are not yet in your bill folder, but I will be submitting them to the committee. I thank the committee, not only for your time today, but for the considerable time and work that this bill has placed on you and your staff. I ask for a favorable, re favorable report on HB 832 and thank you. Thank you, Delegate Ruth. Next, Debbie Jason, please, for two minutes. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair and the Ways and Means Committee for allowing me to speak today. I'm here in strong support of HB 832. 
I have submitted written testimony and am happy to answer questions. In 2011, I founded the Maryland Homeschoolers Facebook group, which is now the largest Facebook group for Maryland home educators at 13,700 members. When we posted in the group about HB 832, some people chose to respond by attacking those who were in favor of the bill. The group moderators were harassed through private messages. And Delegate Erican's favorite private Facebook hold the line group. Lies and name calling were used against people who supported the bill. Even my own children were targeted by this hate. While I 100% believe in free speech, as a social media moderator, I was faced with the unenviable task of closing off commenting in specific HB 832 posts and removing people who broke our group rules against online bullying. There's been a trend of intimidation about HB 832 on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. People who expressed support of the bill were outright bullied and accused of various absurd things like being government plants. On her YouTube page, Delegate Erican publicly commented and called me naive and insinuated that I was stupid. And I wasn't the only one. She called other people in favor of the bill selfish. Support for the Homeschool Advisory Council does exist, but individuals are tired and embarrassed by the manner in which some of the dissenters are conducting themselves. Madam Chair. Privately, families Madam voice Chair. their support, but given the environment. Oh, quiet, please, um, Ms. Ms. Jason. The only person that should be speaking is Ms. Jason. Privately, families voice their support, but given the environment that the anti-832 homeschoolers have created, I can understand why more people are afraid to speak publicly. Personally, I support HB 832 because I hope the council may be able to advocate for better and more consistent access to special education services for homeschool children with disabilities. Right now, school principals make that decision. So while one family in Anne Arundel County may be able to get speech services, another family five miles away may have to pay out of pocket for the same exact services. I urge you to give HB 832 a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Miriam Snare, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair and other esteemed members of the Ways and Means Committee for allowing me time to speak favorably about HB 832. My name is Miriam Snare, and I have also submitted written testimony and will gladly answer any questions. I have been homeschooling in Maryland in District 8 for seven years and will likely continue to do so until my younger child graduates in 10 years. As Delegate Ruth said, the State Department of Education has other advisory councils that focus on the interests of special student populations. So I believe the Homeschool Advisory Council would be a great benefit to the Maryland community. For example, MSDE meets quarterly with public school representatives from all 24 jurisdictions to discuss concerns and possible policy development. Repeated requests to invite homeschool leaders to those meetings, even just to listen, have been refused by MSDE. The proposed council would be able to peel back that secrecy of those meetings and alert families to why and how the state may be deciding to make changes to homeschool policies and regulations. The goal of the Homeschool Advisory Council is not to further regulate homeschoolers. The council would have no authority other than to make non-binding recommendations on behalf of homeschoolers and to make information publicly available so that we homeschoolers are no longer caught by surprise when the state decides to make a change. Open access to the decision-making process that affects my children's education is of great importance to me. Therefore, I urge a favorable report for HB 832. Thank you. Thank you. Alessandra Keener, please, for two minutes. Chair Atterbury, members of the Ways and Means Committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak favorably about HB 832. My name is Alessandra Keener, and I am the founder of the Maryland Homeschool Association. You've received my substantial written testimony, and before I answer any questions you may have about those facts and charts, I'd like to share some thoughts. So why did MDHSA ask for HB 832 to be introduced? Well, I am the daughter of an immigrant who came to America at the age of 35 without speaking a word of English. The legacy my father left me was to always take the opportunity to speak for others who can't be heard through their own voice. Over time, I learned that my responsibility is actually to open the door to others and help them find a seat at the table so they can speak for themselves. And that's what HB 832 seeks to do. For decades, homeschool policymaking and regulatory discussions have been handled by a select few self-appointed leaders within the homeschool community, myself included. 
At the last interested parties meeting hosted by MSDE, not a single homeschool parent, not a single person of color, not a single non-Christian person was at that table. Instead, there was a retired public school teacher and owners of private schools who were asked for input on critical homeschooling issues. HB 832 would be a council for a new generation of homeschool leaders to gather, not as government puppets, but as an independent and objective voice that upholds the interests of homeschool families throughout the state. The single point that I wish to stress to you today is that the vast majority of Maryland homeschoolers are not anti-government fanatics and we're not religious zealots. We are a diverse group of educated families made up of secular, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian families. We are a rainbow of racial and ethnic identities. We are simply asking to have a legally recognized voice that MSDE must take into consideration before the state continues to make policies and regulations about homeschooling. I ask that you vote favorably on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Comstock for two minutes, please. She's not here, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Gary Cox for two minutes, please. Gary Cox, I see you. You are not muted. I don't know if you're trying to speak. Okay, we will circle back to Mr. Cox. Uh, the last favorable is Latasha Banzi, please, for two minutes. She's not here, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Cox, are you able to speak? Okay, well, that was the last of the favorables. There's quite a few unfavorables, so I will see if there are any questions from the committee, from any of these individuals who are here to testify. Uh, Delegate Wilkins. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Delegate Ruth, I know that you've worked uh, really hard on this bill and also have worked to speak with and engage the impacted community. Before we move to the opposition, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to please restate um, the important goal of this bill um, so that we can just understand again um, what the bill does and its impact um, before we go into um, the, the opposition testimony. I think you're on mute. I got it. Thank you so much for the question, uh, Delegate. So, so really, the, the goal is very simple. It's just an advisory committee. It has no regulatory oversight. Um, it's just a way of um, in, engaging MSDE um, with the homeschool community and being able to, to advise MDE on the issues and concerns of the homeschool community. And, you know, we always envisioned that this council would be communicating with the homeschool community in terms of you know, making sure that they are representing the homeschool community. And I've tried very hard to make sure that the council does represent the diversity of the homeschool community, but it was it was always envisioned that um, that they would, you know, in, in turn communicate with the larger community. And in fact, one of the amendments that, that I've been working on um, actually adds um, uh, public town halls for homeschoolers as to the duties of the council to increase the, the opportunity for the council and then by, by extension MD, MSDE to, to hear from the council. Um, and it, the council would not create any additional regulatory oversight. Um, it's, it's just an avenue of communication like, like other councils in MSDE. And I did also just confirm with MSDE that the council itself would be subject to the public meeting laws. So their meetings would be open as well. Thank you so much. Delegate Guyton. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And thank you, Delegate Ruth, for bringing this bill. Certainly, we're about to hear some opposition. And I think I know I have received a lot of emails in opposition to this bill. But I, I want to reach out to um, those who have just testified favorably, because I'm trying to, to decide whether those voices are truly a minority 
of louder voices or whether there are there is a larger homeschool um, community that really does want this to go through. It's very difficult for us to know whether we're hearing from uh, typical homeschoolers or whether we're hearing from a minority. So I, one of you, I believe it was Ms. Keener, mentioned that uh, a homeschooling association brought this to Delegate Ruth and asked her to, to sponsor this bill. Could, could the three of you or one of you uh, speak to the numbers of homeschoolers that you have in your groups and communities that you believe are favorable uh, versus unfavorably opposed to this bill? Because certainly we want to listen to the will of people, but we also want to make sure that we're listening to a representative sample of those constituents. Thank you. Ella, Ellis, uh, do you want to take that? Sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to um, answer that question. And that's an excellent question, um, Del Delegate Guyton, and I'm sure many of the other delegates on this uh, committee also have those same concerns. Um, unfortunately, nobody can actually answer that question for you. What I can tell you is that we have been fighting a misinformation campaign about this bill since the day it actually appeared on the Maryland uh, State Legislative website. Um, Delegate Ericon made a, uh, a rather inflammatory video um, that was posted before she had the benefit of actually reading the bill. Um, and it incited a lot of hysteria within the homeschool community. People have latched onto some of those talking points, um, particularly the, the families who believe that government should have zero involvement in their family lives. Um, we know that um, HSLDA, the Homeschool Legal De uh, Defense Association, has hired a New York City public relations firm to specifically fight this bill. In the, um, in the written testimony that I submitted to you, you'll be able to see a copy of the email that they've been sending out as part of their press release. So you'll see some of the fear-mongering tactics that they've been using. It has generated a lot of press outside of Maryland. Um, why are they doing this? You'd have to ask them. Um, you know, I, I actually received an email from an individual who minced no words in terms of why they can't support this. And for them, they can't support this because they're afraid that their conservative Christian values are going to be trampled on by a diverse representative body who will finally actually have an opportunity to participate in what has always been backdoor negotiations at MSDE regarding homeschool policymaking and regulatory uh, mm -hmm. discussions. So, you know, you've gotten a lot of, of um, you've gotten a lot of emails from people. They have organized extremely well. There is no way that a band of, of grassroots volunteers can compare to um, an organization with an operating budget of probably $15 million who can afford to hire a New York City PR firm. We just, we can't do that. So are all the emails that you're getting actually from Maryland homeschoolers? Probably not. Um, you know, we know that some people are boasting that they are sending out multiple emails and calling offices multiple times. Um, again, you know, it, it's hard to say. You know, we know that privately, and uh, and Debbie Jason can probably um, comment on this better since she is uh, an administrator and a moderator for the largest uh, social social. Uh, media Facebook group for homeschoolers in Maryland. Um, privately, people are having conversations where they do support it, but they just don't want to risk. Um, they just don't want to risk the backlash. In fact, the New Hampshire Advisory Council, which is the only state in America uh, that actually has a homeschool advisory council, declined to even submit informational testimony that would be completely neutral about the way that their homeschool advisory council is uh, functions up there in New Hampshire. And, and they said pretty, pretty specifically, we can't risk making HSLDA mad at us because they'll just make our job harder up here in New Hampshire. So mm -hmm. I, I just, that's all I can say that, you know, who knows what the actual percentages are, but we do know that we are outnumbered and outflanked because of the misinformation and the Thank fear. Thank you. Model. Thank you. More questions, and then we have quite a few witnesses to get to. Delegate Boatler. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, this this is not so much a question, um, except it is a comment about some of the testimony that we're hearing today, and especially um, going after a sitting state delegate. Uh, I've you know I've been in this committee a long time. And I've never seen that allowed to be done. We should never be questioning why certain delegates, you know, put in legislation 
We should not be questioning like that. And we've had two people on this and nothing's being said. And I think that's very inappropriate for them to attack a sitting state delegate like that and to impugn her character and to assume that she's doing this stuff just to be mean and evil spirited. You know, we all have differences of opinions. And this is why we have these bill hearings, so that we can give people the opportunity to speak as to why they support legislation or don't support it. I think this is, I think in the future, we need to put a stop to that. We should not allow that to go on. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I appreciate your opinion. I would not have let any type of testimony continue if I felt that it was impugning anyone's uh, character. What I had heard was something that had happened and anyone can certainly go and watch the video that was spoken of because the video is, is public. I've actually had other members come to me that aren't on this committee and ask me to watch the video. I have not watched the video, but anybody is, is welcome to go watch the video and decide for themselves what they think of, of what was being said on the video. Um, but thank you for your comments, Delegate Boatler. Uh, Delegate Rose. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to weigh in, you know, I was making a lot of notes during this testimony. Uh, my office has gotten over 550 emails. That doesn't count all of the phone calls. And we verify that these were coming from Maryland families. That's number one, fact number one. Um, as far as uh, when this when this first came to light, I reached out to um, the, I'm going to say the best daycare mom I've ever had in my life. She's been a homeschool mom of her five children for several, several years. And, um, you know, she's been very active in uh, the Maryland Homeschool Education Association. The Maryland Homeschool Education Association was founded in 1980. This new group, which is apparently, it seems somewhat, you know, um, overly interested in social media and, and Facebook posts and things of that nature. We all know, especially as elected officials, we get back and forth and all sorts of Facebook, you know, as elected officials, we get attacked. Um, you know, nobody should behave in that way. And I'm not condoning that in any way, shape or form. But when we're talking about public policy and something as important as the rights of parents to homeschool their children, I, I think that, you know, uh, quite frankly, uh, you mentioned New Hampshire, no other states need this advisory council. Um, I don't see what problem we're trying to solve. I verified what I already knew somewhat about homeschooling and that, you know, there's oversight twice a year. There's interaction with the State Board of Education. Um, there's plenty of opportunity for families to address concerns and situations without creating yet another advisory board. And, um, you know, this organization seems to have uh, come to be, and from my investigation into the background of it, it's somewhat new. And everybody has the right to organize and, and you know, do what they'd like to do with their family. The whole point of homeschooling is to not have oversight board, additional advisory boards. You should be able to work directly between your family and the State Board of Education to educate your child in the way that you see fit and best. What one family does based on their own religion or any other situation has no bearing on another family. And so, you know, I just want to kind of make that point. Um, you know, I appreciate the homeschool um, uh, universe out there and the parents that put in the countless hours and time uh, that is behind doing that. I tried to do it and it's, it's tough. So I give you all credit for educating your children the way that you feel best. I just firmly believe that this advisory uh, board is completely unnecessary. And I would like to see, you know, hopefully <coughs> some of the rhetoric cut back, but thank you so much. And I guess I'll say, isn't that so, since I sort of didn't ask a question. So thank you, Madam Chair. May, may I address that, Madam Chair? I, I um, no, it, it was really kind of rhetorical. We got to get this, this puppy moving here. Um, so I, I just have a quick question for uh, Delegate Ruth, um, or if Ms. Keener or Ms. Jason are best equipped to answer this, but it kind of goes back to uh, Delegate Wilkins' initial question, just getting at the purpose 
of the legislation. And when I'm looking at the legislation, I really only see three things that are happening, right? So first meet, and, and I know there are amendments, so I'm not looking at those. I'm just looking at what's proposed on our system here. Meet four times a year, gather information of the needs of the homeschool. So what the homeschoolers want, and then advise the state superintendent and the state board and us what those needs are. So in my mind, that seems beneficial to homeschoolers because you are trying to get together and tell those that make policy decisions what it is in fact that you want. So I'm just trying to really understand, am I missing something? Because I have also, my office has received 300 and some emails. We have received somewhere between 75 to 100 schools, which my aide just, tell me, just told me, Delegate Rose, they are all from Maryland. Um, so I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing something here. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and yes, that is, that is all it does. I will say that one of the amendments removes the part about gather information because um, there was a lot of concern about that. It was never intended to be any kind of like intrusive, we're going to collect data, um, you know, that we can then use against you. It was just supposed to be, they're going to conduct surveys about, you know, what do you think about whether homeschoolers should be able to play sports in schools or what do you think about this? Um, you know, but but because of the concern about it, I've just removed that part altogether. And then, as as I mentioned, I, I the amendments also add a public town hall that the council would hold um, annually to, to hear more from the community because trying to make sure we're hearing hearing you know as much as possible from the community. So so really you're right that is that is all it does. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So we um, committee bear with us. We're going to start letting the um, um, unfavorables in just not everyone at once so that um, staff doesn't go, uh, uh, have a hard time here. So the first uh, several folks here, Edward Meeks is first for two minutes, please. Well, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to speak. I promise to be very brief. My name is Father Ed Meeks. I'm pastor of Christ the King Catholic Church in Towson. My parish has sponsored a homeschool umbrella as well as a homeschool co-op quite successfully for 25 years having received our letter of registration from the Maryland State Department of Education in May of 1997. We currently help to facilitate the educational needs of 57 children in 25 families. With that as context, two questions come to mind regarding HB 832. The first question is, is this a solution in search of a problem? Now, I don't say that to be glib or dismissive, but as I read the stated purpose of this bill, and Delegate Ruth said this particular language apparently has been removed, but in the original, in the original uh, permutation of this bill, the, the stated purpose was, quote, to gather information on the needs of homeschool parents and homeschool umbrella schools, end quote. My reaction to that, based on experience and factual knowledge is that there is currently a virtually unlimited supply of readily available expert resources that already addresses the needs of homeschool parents and homeschool umbrella, school, uh, umbrella schools. Which then brings up my second question, which frankly is, who would this bill benefit? Homeschool families or ultimately those who seek to impose unnecessary and unwelcome controls on them and on the rights of parents to educate their children as they see fit. I understand that it will start out as an advisory council, but I feel that like so many other bills, HB H32 will be the camel's nose under the tent. Thank you. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up your testimony, please. Okay, leading ultimately to intrusive regulatory restrictions on homeschooling. The bill itself on page four, lines eight and nine refers to, quote, homeschooling as a trusted parent-directed quality you, school. I'm going to have to ask you to conclude your testimony. Okay, thank you. I agree with the, with the characterization, as I hope you do. And if you do, 
then to paraphrase an old adage, since it isn't broken, then please don't try to fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Bush for two minutes, please. Madam Chair, let me uh, try to answer your question why so many homeschool families have contacted your office with concern. The uh, Maryland State Homeschool Advisory Council uh, addressed in uh, Delegate Ruth, who is a friend of mine and whose son graduated from my oversight uh, program in Maryland, would not be a freestanding autonomous homeschool council. It would actually be part of the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, it would be a council that um, not a homeschool council that includes some MSDE members, but an MSDE council that includes some homeschool members. So what homeschool families are concerned about is that statutorily placing what should be freestanding autonomous homeschool advocacy under MSDE's framework and making it the supposed legal voice of homeschooling in Maryland in exchange for quarterly council meetings is a chilling thought to homeschool families. We don't want our advocacy placed under MSDE. We don't want the primary or what could perhaps become, uh, be seen as the only voice of homeschoolers in the state to be entangled with MSDE. Uh, homeschooling should remain a grassroots advocacy uh, 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 process and not tied into MSDE. This it, it makes us uh, less, uh, powerful as a grassroots uh, concern. It locks us into uh, working through uh, just this small appointed council. They are not voted in. They do not have to uh, be accountable to the grassroots community. Because they are not voted in, they are not answerable to anyone. They are only accountable to themselves. Everything that the council uh, says they want to do and want to make improvements on can I'm be gonna, addressed, I'm sorry, can be I'm addressed gonna, without a council. And no amendments that Delegate Ruth wants to propose will uh, change the fact that having- um, Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, Khadija Ali Coleman, please, for two minutes. Greetings, Madam Chair, and to all of you on the Ways and Means Committee. I'm here today to speak on the proposed Homeschool Advisory Board outlined in House Bill 832. I'm appreciative of the amendments Delegate Ruth has submitted regarding the town hall meetings and more connectivity with homeschooling parents. But I'm still wary as a Black parent who has witnessed the historical behavior of being politically disenfranchised in the state. My name is Dr. Khadija Ali Coleman, a resident of Prince George's County, Maryland, and director of Black Family Homeschool Educators and Scholars. I'm co-editor of the book, Homeschooling Black Children children in the U.S. theory, practice, and popular culture, and I'm mother of a daughter who I homeschooled off and on for 13 years and who went on to receive a full scholarship and other scholarships to attend the University of San Francisco. This homeschooler also earned an associate from CCBC while homeschooling for high school. Homeschooling students on a college pathway proportionate to their population are more apt to persist and graduate college, often graduating with higher GPAs. My main concern is that the advisory board would not offer more benefit than portfolio reviews that homeschoolers are already mandated to go through. I believe that HB 832 is a bad idea predicated on the assumption that it will be representative of all homeschoolers. I believe that the advisory board would not have the ability to be racially or ideologically diverse for a homeschooling community that is not homogenous. So first, the state already requires homeschooling homeschoolers to participate in quarterly portfolio reviews. Portfolio reviews should be sufficient enough for the state to get any information they need to know how to best support homeschooling families. During these reviews, reviewers are seeing the diverse ways we are implementing instruction in the home. They are seeing the ways parents are using resources. There is nothing the state can do to get greater insight from all homeschoolers schoolers beyond portfolio reviews. Not a segment of homeschoolers participate in portfolio reviews. All homeschoolers go through this. So this proposed 
advisory board is an unnecessary add-on. Secondly, according to my research, black and white families often choose to homeschool for different reasons. Many black families do so because of institutional practices that disenfranchise their children in often punitive and harmful ways. Before 2020, more than 5% of homeschool students were African-American and that rate increased 500% once the COVID-19 global pandemic led to massive school closings. And race is not only an indicator of the diversity within our community. No two homeschooling families are the same just because they are black or white. Some are religious, some are not. Some incorporate experiential learning in their homeschooling practices while others may, may be tethered to a curriculum, on and on and on. And I've, advisory board sounds like the first step in implementing more restrictive or oversight of homeschoolers. Wrap um, up your testimony. Please pull the bill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that is how you wrap up testimony. <laughs> Thank you for that. Jonathan Burton, please, for two minutes. He's not here. Okay. Thank you, Haley. Daniel Beasley, please, for two minutes. Thank you. Good, af good afternoon, Madam Chair, Honorable Committee members. Thank you for listening today. My name is Daniel Beasley. I'm a staff attorney for the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, or HSLDA. We are a national nonprofit organization with the mission to preserve the liberty to homeschool. We have more than 100,000 member families in the U.S., uh, more than 1,500 member families in Maryland. We serve homeschool families regardless of the religious or, or political beliefs. I'm also a homeschool graduate and a homeschooling dad. Uh, first, I'd just like to clarify that we did not hire a uh, New York City PR firm, as someone else had mentioned. I'm not sure where that's coming from, but it's not accurate. Uh, we have informed parents in Maryland about this bill and uh, the calls that you are receiving from uh, our email are from Maryland homeschoolers. We do oppose HB 832. I believe Delegate Ruth has good intentions, but I also believe that this bill would not advance the best interest of Maryland homeschooling families because it is unnecessary to meet the needs of homeschooling families. It lacks the technical structure to ensure that it is used to preserve liberty and it limits the effectiveness of grassroots advocacy. Homeschooling is a grassroots movement. It has thrived because loving parents are committed to providing their child with an excellent education and they've done so without government assistance. Rather than creating a advisory council within the Department of Education to study homeschoolers, or conduct surveys and advise the department, we believe that Maryland should respect the liberty of homeschooling families and, there sh and should there be a need for input, they should reach out or provide opportunities for uh, public comment. Uh, while Delegate Ruth should be applauded for wanting to give homeschoolers a voice within the department, I believe HSL, uh, uh, HB 832 ultimately reduces the number of voices to which the department may listen. Finally, it should be clear that a vast majority of homeschooling community oppose this bill. Since it is designed to benefit homeschoolers, additional input is needed before moving HB 832 forward. For these reasons, and those in my written testimony, please oppose HB 832. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Alyssa Andrews, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, delegates. My name is Alyssa Andrews. I'm a homeschooling mother of four in Wacomico County, and I strongly oppose HB 832. Protect homeschooling advocacy in our state by giving this bill an unfavorable report. First, this bill does not solve a problem, as Maryland already has some of the best homeschooling regulations in the country. I love homeschooling here, and I love my ability to advocate directly to you. Our state is a model for homeschooling regulation without an additional MSDE council. Don't try to fix something that isn't broken. Second, Maryland's homeschooled children are thriving, having not experienced the myriad consequences of public school closures over the past two years. You've listened today to many powerful testimonies about the problems facing the public school system, and that is where the legislature should focus. Finally, this bill creates an unnecessary expert homeschooling voice above other voices. My experience as a homeschooling mother has taught me that I am the expert on my children and their education. I noticed when my oldest son was struggling to learn to read in public school, and I advocated for him to get extra help. I knew the school was wrong when they told me that he couldn't get help as resources were tight and his standardized test scores weren't poor enough to warrant it. 
I made the decision to homeschool. I found a strong phonics program, spent countless hours with him, sounding out every word. I encouraged him day in and day out as he worked to become a strong reader. And I continue to do so, so, so as his love for reading blossoms. This committee proposed in the bill would overshadow my voice in advocating for my own children and their needs. Please stand with me and my children today in voting unfavorable for HB 832. Thank you. Thank you. Tammy Schilling, please, for two minutes. Uh, thank you. My name is Tammy Schilling. I've been homeschooling in Maryland continuously for 20 years. I'm testifying today to ask you to give an unfavorable report to HB 0832. Homeschoolers don't need it. We don't want it. This bill is the opposite of transparent, accountable governance. We already have homeschool regulations that work really well in this state, and it makes it an attractive state for homeschoolers to move to. Every homeschooler I know checks the state's regulations before choosing to move there. A state with an unelected and unaccountable committee purporting to be the voice of homeschooling would immediately be stricken from the list of potential places for most homeschoolers to move. I have known hundreds of homeschool families in the last two decades, and no two of them are the same. Each homeschooler is a unique voice that already speaks for itself as we are doing for you right now. It is impossible for any committee, no matter how instantiated, to be representative of the homeschool community. Further, this will be a group of persons handpicked by government officials and completely unaccountable to homeschoolers or the voters in general. It gives MSDE the freedom to say that they have listened to homeschoolers while actually only hearing the voices they chose. This is clearly the fox guarding the hen house. At the very least harmful, it will create another layer of government that homeschoolers will have to monitor and wade through to protect our homeschool freedoms. And whatever harm they do, they will not be held accountable at a ballot box or anywhere else. Once installed, there will be no way for us to get rid of these people. Please show that you are listening to the homeschool community and give an unfavorable report to HB 0832. Thank you. Emily Ware, please, for two minutes. Emily, we can't hear you. You're muted. There. <laughs> no, thank you. You're My welcome. name is Emily Weir, and I'm a lifelong Marylander, a former public school teacher, and my husband and I have three kids. My oldest is going to be homeschooling very shortly. I know so many homeschool families, um, and I'm excited to join this community. As the former public school teacher, I know some of the baggage that comes with MSDE. I know those people work so hard trying to make things good for public schools, but I remember all the red tape I had to wade through, and I don't want that coming in as I'm getting ready to provide for my own children's education. Um, as you can see, we clearly are invested and able to communicate our desires and needs and represent ourselves, and having another body just to reiterate what a lot of other people have said, it, it, it makes it so that way you have this false impression of a representative sample of the homeschooling community. I think about that one Facebook group with the Maryland Education Association. They do not represent many, many homeschoolers that I've worked with for years, uh, both in professional and personal contexts. Um, so I just would like to ask for the opposition like everyone else here has, um, because my training and experience has showed me time and time again that yet another layer, it's well-intentioned, but it is not helpful and we, we don't want it. So thank you. Tiffany Saunders, please, for two minutes. Hi, good afternoon and thank you. Uh, my name is Tiffany. I am a homeschooling parent in Anne Arundel County. I live in Maryland. I homeschool in Maryland. I am not a member of HSLDA. I am a parent who keeps abreast of legislation and things that could affect me and my family and those who I care about in the community. Um, I would like that you vote an unfavorable report on HB 832. 
I'm going to reiterate what Dr. Ali Coleman and several others have said that homeschooling families in Maryland are such a diverse group. I'm friends with friend uh, with people who are immigrants, children of immigrants, come from mixed races and cultures, who are secular, who are religious. They are across the gender and sexuality spectrums. They have one child. They have multiple children. I could go on and on and on. Um, and I just feel like there's no way that one 16 person group could speak for all of our voices when we can speak best for ourselves. Um, and in lead up to this, um, to my testimony, I reached out to several of the delegates on the committee and I had one who said, oh my, one of the aides, not one of you, not one of the delegates who said pretty much, oh my goodness, you guys are such a strong grassroots vocal group as individuals. As individuals, we know how to navigate the system because we have to. We are very well versed on this. And for those of us who are maybe newer to the system, there's a lot of mentors out there and we can find them. Um, and I just want to say that I really appreciate that I have the ability currently to doc, talk directly to my rep representatives and I have an equal voice to anybody else who talks to the representative and my representative can come and represent me an advisory council I feel will be struggling to represent such a diverse group of people. So thank you for your time. Committee, I'm going to ask from the folks that we've heard on the unfavorable so far, are there any questions for those folks? Because what we're going to do is move those folks out and then bring a next group of folks in. So are there any questions for anyone who has testified so far? Okay, seeing none, I will thank those individuals for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Madam and Chair, may I add one thing I was no, not able to say? No, ma'am. No, no, ma'am. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next group of folks, unfavorable, Mr. Joel Fisher, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I'm Joel Fisher and I am the administrator for Wellspring Christian Family Schools, uh, a private school in Umbrella here in Maryland. Um, I'm also a homeschool graduate and also a homeschool dad. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. On behalf of the homeschooling families enrolled in Wellspring, I am asking the committee to oppose HB 832. While this bill is purported to give a greater voice to the homeschooling community in Maryland, it will do just the opposite. Maryland homeschooling families already have numerous channels to express their needs, including local board of education homeschool liaisons, state and local homeschool organizations that serve homeschooling families, elected officials who can voice our concerns as their homeschooling constituents whenever needed, and the Maryland State Department of Education via the homeschool information meetings that hold several times each year. HB 832 would transfer the broad platform of advocacy we've already enjoyed to a primarily a political state level entity perceived as the homeschooling community's official mouthpiece. This will mute the homeschooling voice in Maryland rather than help it. And for those reasons, I respectfully ask that your committee oppose this bill. Thank you very much. Next, Victoria Baco, please, for two minutes. Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I've also submitted written testimony. I'm a homeschool mom of four, soon to be five in Anne Arundel County. My own education began at St. Mary's in Annapolis, followed by five years of being homeschooled. Then I graduated from Broadneck High School and received my bachelor's at Towson University. I know that most of you on the committee have a particular passion for supporting children and fam families, especially in the realm of education. And many of you have worked extensively to improve opportunities for the children of Maryland, and I thank you for your dedication. As a homeschool support group leader, I'm happy to say that homeschoolers are thriving under current policy. I haven't spoken to a single homeschooler who wants this bill, and I've personally talked to at least five umbrella leaders who shared that they don't want this legislation and were never consulted about it. 
While many of our schools are struggling with large class sizes, homeschool parents frequently give up a second income and dedicate themselves to the one-on-one -on -one education of their children. And we truly are a diverse group of people. Today, the racial and socioeconomic makeup of homeschoolers reflects the US population. And more single parents are homeschooling today than when I was homeschooled growing up. In my own home, between my immigrant husband, family members with chronic illness and a child, with autism and giftedness, we have unique needs as a family. While others may have a similar mix when you look at statistics on paper, no other family can be just like our family. How can an appointed committee really speak for what we need? How could it speak for the needs of another family who may appear similar upon first glance, but is actually quite different? We each have unique talents, challenges, dreams, and dignity. And I ask you today to please give an unfavorable report to this bill because an appointed committee will not be able to speak for all of us. Thank you very much for your time. Sharice Vanderworken, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I want to say that I'm acting as an individual. I have no connection with HSLDA and I have not been contacted by them. I am a mother of three and I homeschool in Anne Arundel County. I oppose this bill primarily because a 16 person council cannot accurately represent the nuanced and diverse opinions of thousands of Maryland homeschoolers. More concerning is that it would be a self-perpetuating body that has no accountability with the people it supposedly represents. The council may be open access, but we would have no recourse if the council acts in a way that jeopardizes our freedoms. The Maryland State Department of Education could use the council as an official voice of the homeschool community and have a legal reason to ignore individuals and grassroots groups. I echo sentiments expressed by people on both sides of this bill that we are not a homogenous or partisan group. However, I think this bill, even if amended, would do a disservice to the inherent diversity among homeschoolers. It will marginalize the voices of individuals and the myriad grassroots groups who historically have done and currently do good advocacy work for our community. I respectfully urge you to listen to the voices of the hundreds of homeschoolers who have shared their concerns and do not establish this homeschool advisory council. Thank you. Ruger, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Ways and Means Committee. As a homeschooling parent, I strongly oppose HB 0832. I've read it thoroughly. Uh, while I did listen to Dan Beasley's comments, I formed my own opinion. The Maryland Homeschool Association appears to be a voice for progressive homeschoolers. From the limited amount I know about them, they do represent a, a small fraction of the homeschool community. And they may have done work to preserve freedom in the past, which I've appreciated. Homeschooling should not be a partisan issue. So I'm perplexed at the partisan way the Maryland Homeschool Association has rushed this through. We're out here. Um, they know how to reach out to us. HB 0832 is being rushed. The committee is being asked to favorably, favorably report on amendments they have not seen. It would have the unintended consequence of further isolating the Maryland Homeschool Association. Maryland should have a progressive voice as well as conservative voices. And this legislation, if advanced, would further isolate. And that's not what we need at this, uh, this time in our history. There are far more effective ways to represent homeschoolers. There are far more effective ways to connect homeschoolers with valuable resources for their children. While appreciated, Delegate Ruth's possible amendments in process cannot address that the bill is the opposite of what most constituents are asking for. We simply do not want the Maryland State Department of Education to have a conduit to extend over us further. Perhaps the bill has not been thought through. Perhaps the bill mistakenly assumes that the Maryland State Department of Education has the ultimate say over homeschool regulations. The legislature has the ultimate say over regulations through legislations. And that is why we want to continue to rely on this legislature to support us. Perhaps the bill has been thoroughly considered and is a veiled attempt to grab formal authority. 
I do not know about you the. Know, please wrap up your testimony. What del what delegate Ruth does next will reveal her intentions. Thank you. Members of the committee, are there any questions for the folks that just testified before we move on to the next group? Okay, seeing none, thank you to those individuals that just testified. Um, next, Gretchen Sisk, please, for two minutes. Thank you, can you hear me, Madam Chairman? All right, good afternoon. My name is Gretchen Hayden Sisk. I'm a Baltimore County re resident and a veteran homeschooler. I strongly oppose HB 832. I think the genesis of the bill was well-intended, but if enacted, will lead to unintended consequences, as sometimes happens, as we saw with No Child Left Behind or Common Core. I think it's naive to think otherwise. I think the proposed advisory council could never accurately represent or the diverse homeschool population. The members are appointed, not elected. I think the council will eclipse other voices and become the official voice of homeschoolers in Maryland. I also think that this bill has been rushed. It was just uh, proposed a month ago. Um, I do not feel that the homeschool community as a whole was involved. And I think there are numerous other options that we could explore to really um, do good work without adding another layer, as has been mentioned. In closing, I just wanna say that there are few rights that are dearer to me than the right to homeschool my children. Delegate Ruth, you have crossed the finish line. You were able to educate your son in the way that you deemed best. I still have a long way to go. Please withdraw HB 832. To Maryland homeschoolers, I say, if we can educate our own children, we can certainly advocate for ourselves. If there is one benefit to this bill, it is that it has woken up Maryland homeschoolers and challenged us to be our own voice. So I, I respectfully ask that the, the bill be withdrawn. This, all the calls and emails you're getting, they're not a hoax. They're not people being bullies. It's not a small faction of the homeschooling population. It is the diverse and wonderful homeschool population saying thank you, but no thank you. Garrett, please, for two minutes. Sorry, Madam Chair, we didn't hear the name. Dane Garrett, Garrett please, for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. This is Dane Garrett. I'm the chairman of the American Solidarity Party here in Maryland, and I recommend an unfavorable report on this bill. Um, I thank Delegate Ruth for her concern for the homeschool community and a desire to make sure it's represented. But this board can't be representative. Sorry, my son's in the background giving some commentary. Um, but there's no way this board can be representative of the homeschool community. It has to be political appointments just because of the nature of how it's created. Um, it will become the voice of homeschoolers to the Maryland Department of Education, which will then be used as it wishes to be used. Everybody involved in this has good intentions, um, but I believe this will not be productive and recommend an unfavorable report. I yield the balance of my time. Next, Kristen Douglas, please, for two minutes. Is, let's see, is Kristen Douglas in the room here? Okay, I do not see Ms. Douglas. Uh, Vince McAvoy, please, for two minutes. Thank you so much, committee, and thank you, Chair, for leading uh, uh, with the esteemed Father Meeks. Um, I, I want to... Um, Having spoken to you, I want to actually speak to the people who are calling in these parents. I have uh, I listened to a lot of these and some of the most articulate, caring, clever parents I've, I've been listening to. And I'm just so very impressed and thankful that you're out there in Maryland to hear these patriots, people concerned about their children. And uh, I found out about this uh, Delegate Parrott, uh, proud of me, Delegate Arrogant, and I watched the video and I knew from the start and want this bill so that you all showed up is testimony to how these processes work that people are looking out for you um and so uh i would 
suggest two things to those that are the, the parents out there that you um, keep in touch with those people that I just mentioned and that you circle back in a couple of days. You're clever people. You know how to use technology and, and to see what what's going to be what with this bill. You want to make sure that this bill doesn't happen. This is not a good bill. The bills that we've heard from this delegate have, have been uh, very harmful to children. I've expressed that in the most professional manner that I can it, with discipline, believe me. So I thank you all for listening. I thank you for taking the time to show up and have your voices heard. People are listening and stay strong. Thank you so much. Next, Matthew D'Agostino, please. D'Agostino for two minutes. He's not here. Okay, thank you. Rachel Hansen, please, for two minutes. She's not here. Okay. Crystal Woodworth, please, for two minutes. Hello, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Meets Committee. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I asked for an unfavorable report on HB 832. I'm a homeschooling mom in Cecil County, Maryland. I know this bill is well-intentioned and I'm in support of other bills proposed by Delegate Ruth. And you can tell that these bills come from a place of compassion. Uh, I object, however, that this is sort of a partisan issue versus Democrats versus, versus liberals. Um, I am a progressive that some of these people have been talking about um, and I am opposed to this bill. Uh, I'm also not informed. Um, I haven't been a victim of fear mongering. I'm a political activist and I follow a lot of legislation and I read a lot of bills. Maryland's homeschooling laws are some of the best laws in the entire country. I know a number of families that chose Maryland over neighboring states because of our fantastic homeschooling environment. The Maryland homeschooling community is very diverse and listed members on the council established by this bill fail to accurately and adequately represent the community. The council gives far too much representation to institutional educators, leaders within, the very, um, leaders within the very system that many homeschoolers have fled because it failed to serve their family's unique needs. These appointments are to be made by an inherently political system, one that has turned public schools into a political battleground. For many years, Maryland homeschoolers have been free from the burdens of bureaucracy and politicization, and we are thriving. There has been an influx of new homeschoolers, but our proactive, caring, and attentive community has welcomed and mentored them. Our County Board of Education uh, employees are wonderful. They provide families with resources and answer questions promptly. Our public libraries offer many free services. We are a community of self-learners and doers. We enthusiastically welcome newcomers and eagerly trade information methods and resources because we're teachers and we're helpers. As you've seen these past few weeks, our community is very capable of tracking, reading, understanding, organizing, and advocating for ourselves when it comes to legislative matters. We do not need, nor do we wish to outsource this responsibility. We do not have any needs that can be met by the state of Maryland. We do not require additional services, representation, or oversight, and nor do we want the burdensome regulations that inevitably come out of such councils. I know this bill does not establish those, but that's what happens. Thank you. Next, Susanna Kipke for two minutes, please. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Susanna Kipke. I am the homeschooling mother of three children, and I am, I don't know, a second generation homeschooler. Uh, my mom homeschooled me here in Maryland, and it's actually why we live in Maryland. Everybody said it. We have great homeschool laws here. My parents chose to come to Maryland um, over Virginia because of the great homeschool laws. I very strongly oppose uh, HB 832. And one thing that I, I just want to mention uh, up front is that I assume that there was no ill intent here, but none of the other delegates who homeschool, nor the senator who homeschools were consulted on this. They weren't asked, does your family want this? Is this going to work for you? Do you want to co-sponsor any of that, including my own husband? So I just want everybody to know that up front, it wasn't something that was like a group effort here among the homeschool families in the, in the legislature. Um, I think my objection to this this bill is this it's fundamental. The, this council is predicated on the idea that something needs to change in our laws, in our homeschool laws, or in our in our um, regulations, and that simply just isn't the case. Everybody said it. Our homeschool laws are working. We have great oversight to make sure kids aren't falling through the cracks and failing to get educated. 
we have great support from the states and the, the counties and our communities. And, um, and so to create a council that purports to speak for us, in a situation where, first of all, we don't want any changes. And second of all, you've all told me you've gotten an enormous amount of communication from us opposing this, which I think should lead you to believe we don't need someone else to purport to be our voice. We are our voice, it's us. And so I urge an unfavorable report on um, HB 832, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Committee, are there any questions for the individuals that just testified um, prior to we move to the last group of folks? Miss, I'm here, but I didn't get to testify. Yep, we have another group of folks that, that we're calling. We're moving people in and out of the Zoom because it was a lot of folks. So I see your name, you're, you're coming soon. Okay, seeing no questions, thank you all for coming uh, to testify today. Next. Eleanor Jones, please, for two minutes. She's not here. Okay, thank you. Now, Jessica Helms for two minutes. Sorry, I had to walk away to be with a child. I'm sure I didn't miss it. <laughs> oh. you, are you okay now? Or Yes, I am, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, let me start out by saying I'm Jessica Helms. I'm in Capitol Heights, Maryland, in Prince George's County. And I am a former Prince George's County school teacher. I actually chose to leave the teaching profession to homeschool my children. Homeschooling is a very important option for a variety of reasons, and there can be no small collection of voices that can accurately represent the needs of such an incredibly politically, religiously, and economically diverse community. At the moment, this bill only assigns and appoints representatives in an unequal manner to the various regions of our state. There is no possible way for one member to represent nine Eastern Shore counties, for example. Um, I also understand that almost 250 citizens signed up unfavorable to this bill today. I would not be surprised this is the most opposition to any bill this committee has ever seen. The homeschooling community includes my friends that are Democrats, Republicans, Green Party, Libertarian, Independents, and no one I have spoken to believes that a politically appointed committee would be more effective than the current method we had of contacting all of you directly and contacting MSDE directly. I urge you to stand with the incredibly diverse homeschool community our state has and issue an unfavorable report to HB 832. A centralized voice cannot possibly accurately represent all of us. I wish to also add that some of the comments made from favorable um, witnesses in the beginning were inaccurate. I was one of the ones blocked from their homeschool group simply for asking a question about this bill. I didn't see anybody calling anybody names or going after anyone else. I actually saw them blocking anyone who suggested opposition and asked a question. And that's not the kind of representation we want to see. Please stand against this bill and submit an unfavorable report. Thank you. Gloria Haig, please, for three, two minutes. You're on mute. Is this good? Yes. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my husband and I moved back to the States from England. Uh, my background in education is that while my husband worked on his doctorate in Oxford, England for three years, I taught in what was considered the best prep school in England. The students learned French, German, Latin, and Greek before the eighth grade. I had a front row seat to watch education, considered to be the finest in England. Many in parliament had attended this school, Tolkien, foreign royalty, movie stars, Oxford professors sent their children to this school, but moving back to the States, our choice was to homeschool based on legion and stimulating curriculum that is available to homeschooling families, producing in children a rich education, stimulation of natural curiosity, development of character. An additional benefit was the intellectual growth of the mothers who were doing the homeschooling. Lost you, you are frozen, unfortunately. If you can hear me, you are frozen. So perhaps you can hang up and try to call back in. In the meantime, I will move to Ms. Alexander. I wish to give testimony that. Yeah, what did you do? We didn't hear a lot of what you said. 
Um, you froze. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you summarize? Uh, yes, my summarization would be just that um, having observed um, education at a very high level in England, it's, it's so comparable to what I did as a homeschooling mom of three boys because of the individuality. The mo this model of education is a win-win and it really shouldn't be tampered with because freedom and creativity and individuality is um, the, what the model is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Alexandra Rack for two minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Allie Rock and I've been homeschooling since 2015. I'm opposed to the creation of a homeschool advisory council for many reasons, but in my short time, I'd like to speak about our experience down here in Charles County. Several years ago, the homeschool community in my district was subjected to combative portfolio reviews by administrative staff in Charles County Public Schools. We came together as a community, advocated for our own behalf to the school board and came to a resolution of the problem all without the intervention of any sort of centralized body. Despite our grassroots advocacy, the superintendent created a homeschool advisory board going forward. So began our years long battle with both the district and this advisory board. The members were selected by the Board of Education. We did not get to vote. The members were drawn into meetings a few times a year and minutes were never made available. We would be informed after the fact in an informal outlet like Facebook. And we were never polled before they met about issues we might want to address. Then the Board of Education would announce crazy and illegal policy changes, like wanting us to register in student view, the system used to track attendance for public school students, or telling us during COVID that we should submit our portfolios digitally to be reviewed anonymously instead of at a mutually agreeable time and location, as is specified in the current COMAR. I personally had to beg for a live review and still haven't received one from last school year because this portfolio scheme they dreamed up was approved by the Homeschool Advisory Board. In reality, the administrator in charge of home education presented the idea to the board who gave feedback, not approval, because they could not, and then the administrator greenlit the new review policy anyway because of staffing issues. This is just a sneak peek into the reality of trying to pull a small group of people together to advise on policy for the most diverse group of people I have ever met in my entire life. There is no collective will for a state level, state run homeschool advisory council which MSDE would allow homeschoolers to be a part of. The homeschool community in District 28, Charles County generally agree on little, but this we are united on. We do not want any iteration of this council in any form. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Jenna Butler, please, for two minutes. Hi, um, good evening, Chair, members of the committee. I think my internet connection, it's been a long hearing for that too. So I'm just gonna do audio if that's okay. <laughs> um, thank you guys for hanging in there with us. Um, my name is Jenna D. Sarah Spuller and I'm a homeschool parent from Anne Arundel County. I'm here in opposition to HB 832. This legislation is well intended, um, but I don't believe it will benefit Maryland's homeschool community as a whole. I am looking forward to seeing the amendments that Delegate Ruth mentioned, although I'm still extremely concerned about the unintended consequences with the fundamental concept. Many points about Maryland's diverse homeschool community and how this council would dilute individual advocacy have already been mentioned, so I won't repeat those. What I will say is that the, homeschool, the homeschooling community does need and deserve absolute transparency and open access to the process of crafting regulations that directly affect them. I wrote this, what I'm gonna say before this hearing and um, listening to everyone else speak, I just believe it even more. It seems that this legislation came out of the lack of communication and the refusal to include homeschoolers in the decision-making process. A better way to make this happen is for MSDE to ensure that stakeholder participation is made top priority when crafting regulations that affect homeschooling families, to keep families informed of any proposed regulation updates and allow ample time and a user-friendly process, a user-friendly process for stakeholder input. <clears throat> That this is what needs to be fixed. There are solutions for that, but they are unfortunately not in this bill. Thank you. Next, Beth Blander, please, for two minutes. Oops, sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, my husband is a first generation American and I miss our democratic roots back up in New York. We've made Maryland our home for 20 or more years at this point. And honestly, one of the things we love the most is the homeschool regulations in this state because they're supportive of families. They give a clear framework for educating our children 
while allowing us to develop a plan that works best for our kids. The system has a favorable checks and balances to make sure our kids get what they need. We choose to review with Baltimore County and our reviewer is amazing, supportive, is always sharing ideas with us. BCPS Homeschool Department as well as MSD have been helpful. We even get surveys from BCPS when they want information or have questions. They recently sent one out about a virtual option. This shows we're already supported as stakeholders by the current system. And as you can see today, the homeschool community is speaking up and can be heard when we need to. I'm concerned that this bill is the first step to a centralized one size fits all model that will never truly be able to represent our vastly diverse community. We homeschool because we love the freedom to provide our, our children with diverse education, activities, and social engagements that meet their needs. The homeschooling community, as you've heard, is filled with so much diversity, backgrounds, life experiences, approaches to education. Families brainstorm and network on social media, through umbrellas, co-ops. In our secular co-op in Baltimore County, we all embrace each other's differences, share our cultures, experiences, and strengths to provide the children a well-balanced educational experience with tons of fun in the process. However, instead of letting families continue to utilize this great community that we've already created, HB 832 is gonna appoint 16 people to represent us. And the local homeschool community has little to no say on who those people are. Even with all the elected officials we have in this state, we continue to hear about all the groups that are not represented in government. So how can 16 individuals adequately represent our interests in this expansive community beyond what the community is already currently doing for ourselves? This bill doesn't fix a problem because there's no problem to be fixed. And as such, I urge the committee to please vote unfavorable report. And I thank the committee for their time. Thank you. There were three other individuals signed up who are not here with us. So um, that is all the folks signed up. Uh, committee members, are there any questions for these uh, last group of folks who testified today? Okay, seeing none, thank you, uh, Delegate Ruth. Thank you to everyone who came to testify. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 8. 32 committee just hold on for 